So there's really three items I'm going to talk about tonight. I'm going to summarize the capital improvement plan. Again, this is a, a section of your budget that you, that you receive. Um, we review it, we update it every year. I'm just going to summarize it tonight. And then we'll go into capital projects, either uh, prior, priorities from previous years, and they will also include some proposals for this year that I've heard either through previous meetings, conversations with you individually, or from staff. And uh, this is not a, 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 a true decision making night. This is your, your first, on both these items, capital projects and salaries and wages, typically we always come back to them because I don't have the general fund numbers completed yet. Many capital projects won't come out of the general fund, but we might have special revenue funds or capital improvement funds or water sewers. But this gets the ball rolling, and we're going to revisit this later in the process. But uh, I think we used to wait until the very end of the process to start this, and then we'd have meeting after meeting after meeting because uh, it just didn't work very well. So I usually do this straight up front. So the capital improvement plan, this was actually developed about 10 years ago when the capital improvement fund was established back in 09 and has a general policy and the planning process like we're going through right now there's always consideration your economic conditions uses demand employed facilities future transportation infrastructure needs uh, location existing facilities and conditions so we're always analyzing roads streets facilities buildings water sewer you know it's just an ongoing process and actually, Marilyn Young, a former finance director, wrote this up initially back in 09. I think she did a pretty good job. But there's some key questions she always thought the board should ask. You know, benefits of the project, justifying the public dollars, cash value to pay, cash available for future operating. Does the project allow the town board goals? You know, so those are some key questions we have to ask ourselves when we talk about county projects. They're pretty straightforward, but these are reminders. Are the citizens willing to pay for the project? That's very key. <laughs> I.e. sewer leakage coming up. We have to ask that question. And then part of this is defining capital assets. We use the goal of designation. Basically, if it's a value of 5000 or more and has a useful life for one or more years, it's a capital asset. Okay. In the budget, a lot of the funds will have capital outlay line items. Those aren't always capital assets. A lot of times they're one-time expenditures. Buying a thirty-five hundred dollar whatever chainsaw, whatever the case may be. Those are just small items. That'd be a really nice chainsaw. <laughs> <coughs> Take the whole board to room. And then, and that used to be just the the, the the plan. And I added to the capital improvement funding portion over the years. And it's nice to break down where where's our capital money come from. Not just our property tax or our sales tax. What do we use? for capital projects. So the capital improvement fund, as we, we talked about last time, was established in 09, went from 2 to 3% sales tax in the So 1% solely goes dedicated to the capital improvement fund. And there's some guidelines. These are the specifics. Repair streets and sidewalks, facilities, and other capital items as needed. The use tax fund is, is currently 2%. It's one of the lowest use tax uh, percentages around. One thing I want to talk to the board about this next year is, is it time to increase that to 3%. Use tax comes off building permits, so it varies. Right? This year we're having a slow year, we don't have a lot of use tax money coming in. The previous two years we had some building going on, especially industrial, we had some good revenues coming in. So those monies fluctuate. Sales tax is more consistent. Park impact fund, these are one time based upon development. The current for residential rate is 1538. We had one new building permit this year on the residential overall Vasquez in Central. I'll be out. Way one. I think we've had five in the last five years. Very slow. Outside of Rogers Farm. There's 55. Storm impact fund, one time fee, 1601 for residents or 114 per square foot. Parks are not applied to non-residential facilities, not like commercial or commercial industrial. They don't pay park impact fees. So the 
storm drains, transportation, in fact, the 2860 or $7.40 cents per square foot. I calculated these numbers for the building permit request from Willow Creek, that large lot along 85 next to Anadarko, at 22,000 square foot building. That's going to bring in some decent one time revenue on the impact fees once it comes in. It's hard to budget for that because I know the building permit has been submitted to my knowledge. I just don't know when they'll build or when they'll pay for it. So I don't know if it's a 2018 or 2019 project. So that's why I try to figure out this time of year. Of course, there's a police impact. We go from three to five impact fee funds. Police and public facilities are our newest ones. Police is pretty low, 759 bucks per residence or 54 cents per, per square foot for non-residential. And then employee facilities, of course, this one used for police stuff. Transportation only used for roads and sidewalks. And then public facilities, of course, like this building in the community center. It's not bad, $2,096 residential and $1.50 per square foot. I mentioned last meeting, we established a sidewalk maintenance fund. Back in 2012, $5 per residential, $15 for commercial, and $30 per industrial. That was the easiest formula we came up with at the time. Only for sidewalks and tree removal or sidewalk related repairs. Oversized overweight fund, again, back in 2012. We're trying to go with some new revenue sources back at that time because the town was eventually broke. These are one time fees based upon the oil and gas industry for the most part. One year we had pretty good income because there's some drilling going, through, drilling going on. They're transporting through town. In recent years, not so much. A lot of activity, but as far as drilling is going through town, no. Conservation Trust Fund. Pretty much all municipalities have a concentration conservation trust fund because it's from your uh, lottery sales, lottery proceeds. Um, really for parks and rec, the real restricted fund. But uh, we'll get in more detail about some projects for those. Veteran Memorial Fund back in 2011 was established. You've heard a lot about that in recent years. The, the memorial was built. That fund right now has really no money in it. So it's based upon donations. And we don't have any obligation to put anything in that fund. No, there's, no, there's nothing in the ordinance or or requirements that we put any money into that. And according to your agreement with the Veterans Committee, you're not expecting us to do anything. No, okay. it's a maintenance care agreement. It's not a financial agreement. Mm -hmm. What it comes down to, if they have a project and there's money in, in our fund, they can come to the board and ask for those funds to be transferred or to be spent. But the only way you can get money in the fund is the donation. <coughs> yes, correct. <clears throat> the board has, and as it did to complete the project, transfer money not to the fund, but to be used for the memorial, but that was a rare situation to get it completed. Um, but to my knowledge, the Veterans Committee, and through their own private CP, they're, they're generating some funds, some decent funds coming in, so I don't think anything that. And just so you know, tomorrow is the first service at the Veterans Memorial. And then, of course, we're always looking for grant funding, mostly through Dole and CDOT, Great Debt, uh, Great, or Goco, Great Outdoors, Colorado. We try to find whatever's out there, but those are the best ones. And we received a lot of grants in the last 10 years from Dole and CDOT. Uh, years ago, I finished up a Goco grant that was started by my predecessor to do the Vault of Lights. And that was a mess because, not to get into the weeds, but the funding at the end of the day ended up paying for one field plus two lights on the other. So we're short for what's field. So, another long story for another day. It's a little dark on that one. It is. Now what I do in this, and again, this will be in your budget book, is then I summarize year to year since 2010 what projects have been completed. I looked at this yesterday and updated from our current budget this year's project, like re subdivision passion chip so we budget 120, we spend about 96, and that doesn't include all the passion though. I still think this is a draft. Community center renovations. Um, I want to talk about that here in a little bit. Is that a, so that 120, that'd be a total for the eight years? No, this is just for 2018. Mm -hmm. <coughs> 
Th this is just this year's project right here. And then sometimes projects don't get accomplished based upon funding and priorities, so I'll, I'll put in here as a reminder we're going to move them and talk about those the following year. Great repair, we didn't have any, we put contingency in there, but we didn't have any projects to do. We got money for the next year. We have to put money in the bridge repair contingency for us, as per our green and rental. Yes. How much is that every year? We try to transfer 50000 every year from the capital improvement fund or the general fund to this property. It's oversized of a weight, which also includes bridge repairs. So they repaired two of our bridges and they said, in the future, we'll do this, but in the future, you need to start budgeting the money for bridges on top. They paid for it. Which bridges is that? 32 and... Well, we have a lot of bridges because culverts are considered bridges. Dave can probably tell you. <clears throat> Technically, the ones that uh, Anadarko took care of was, uh, as you go east of 85 on Grand Avenue around 32, the two, uh, both the big and the small ditch that are right there, they fixed both those bridges, and two years before that, they had done um, the big and small ditch bridges down on uh, County Road 28, or 30, 30, sorry, down on County Road 30. And um, so they had done a total of four bridges. No, I take that back. It was one on County Road 30 and then the two up here. They didn't, they didn't end up having to do the small ditch on 30. So. The, col the box culverts basically, they're considered bridges any kind of service over a waterway technically. Of course the big one is that three and a half. So I forgot my glasses when you're too. <laughs> but uh, this is just a summary, you'll get this as well, but uh, this, uh, some projects haven't been completed yet. You know the slip line, I don't know if that's done yet, but uh, it's your lagoon, that's pending, that's gonna be a multi-year project. We lined the, the wells, we completed that under budget. Um, this community center renovation, that's pretty much for the new roof. Or the refurbished roof. It wasn't supposed to be, right? What's that? Last year when you budgeted that money, it wasn't necessarily to go for a roof, it was really supposed to go for the interior. Exactly, that's what we're gonna talk about next. We're probably gonna do that. But this is just a summary. Once of the years over, even in January, look at actual numbers spent, and I do updates. So it's kind of a nice resource. We can tell the community. What I'm going to do is break this down in, into more of a specific category, such as street, vehicles, sidewalks. But this is just a lump sum of all the capital projects with the various funds. They come out of. It comes out of the dollar amount. Like this year, I don't think I put it in there. I've heard about, we we're budgeting over $2 million in capital projects in totality. But if I go back to 2010, pretty short sweep. We're start, we're using, mostly using water, sewer, and general fund money with a little bit of impact money, but there wasn't much there for conservation costs. So yeah, we, we did about a quarter million dollar projects out of half a million dollar budget and now we're doing multi million dollar budgets. Because it helps we we've added some more funds and a lot of the general fund has been used, but we built up the general fund. We went from about a quarter million cash reserve to about two million cash reserve. So I will update this and get this to you in your budget books when they come out. But uh, I just want to summarize our, our plans very basic and straightforward. It's an annual process, and there's always been work done. So what I've been working on the last couple of weeks is the priority list, which is our specific projects. Last year, last few years, the board has had goal setting sessions. So now it's just an ongoing process through the budget. We actually had a workshop where the board had key or cue cards, index cards. <coughs> And they do the process where they identify the priorities, I, I think it's maybe one through ten or one through five, and then and it started going down, dwindling down to where some projects got pushed off because they didn't have votes, but the projects came up to the top. Mm -hmm. And it was really surprising because what everybody thought was 
would be the first priority was not. It was something that we dropped off. It was really interesting. Don came in from uh, Dola and yeah. helped us out with it. And that's something we can have to consider redoing again, I think, because it's kind of a fun process. Mm -hmm. So last year, the short-term priorities, which we defined one to three years, the senior center, which I'm happy to say that is now completed. Uh, sewer lagoon options to build and on, re on reserves. The wastewater utility plan is currently being uh, completed, probably by January, if not December. And our priorities are two big priorities coming up when we talk about more detail is funding for the design and construction documents and then funding for the construction itself. So we'll get into that in more detail. And then the other one of the three, three of the four top priorities, the third one is the downtown revitalization. So we completed the streetscape concept plan. I want I, I want to bring in the new director of that program to update that plan with the board. I'd like to do that in some for this one of the spring. The underground permit, Dave and I met with Al Ermer. He said probably October, so about a month away, I should be getting those final designs and cost estimates for the underground. And then uh, we really need to meet with local businesses sometime in the wintertime. I'd help you the small business get right on time. Then the financial policy was a fourth priority. Long, uh, developing forecast long term investments. We brought in a piece of investment management. You heard that presentation. Uh, they reached out to me recently again. Uh, we talked a little bit last time. Hollow Trust is still decent, not quite as, as, as good as some of these uh, these investment options, but it's still very liquid. So my recommendation on, on the investments is, is finish our prioritization, establish our budget, and if there's a, a pool of money that the board feels won't be spent in the next few years, instead of putting in a two or three year bond, get a little bit higher rate on or return to the income. Mid-range, four to seven years. Formal marketing and social media plan. Uh, really haven't got into that yet. Kind of ties in a little bit to the downtown plan. Community garden. Either incorporate to a town hall master site plan or find another location for it. You know, we don't have an exact location for it. <coughs> Purchase land, property enhancing economic development in the right places. You know, we're selling three properties now. Uh, we're pending contract with Platte River Farms. I talked to Ken Bachman last week. We're still talking to attorneys about surface use issues and mineral right issues. And just so you know, I, when I talked to him, I said, the board knows we're not going after water rights or oil gas, mineral rights, but we want the mining operation. So we can use it, we want to build a retention pond or water storage. And Mr. Bachman represented them and said, well, he didn't think that was part of what they were, they were talking about. The attorney was talking about it. So you need to clarify. Because the mineral rights and the water rights are already sold. Somebody else owns those. Mr. Sherwood doesn't even have the rights to those. He stripped all those years ago. And then Mr. Boehner, the developer of the energy park, the lead developer, that track B, lot B, South Bend and Darko, he talked to me a year Two years ago, he said, I'm not going to develop it. We need it, the town needs it, because I'm fire district to get some of this green water resolved. The existing retention pond south of Darko, south reach and half. There's a concept of moving that over by the division and turning it right now with the east-west rectangle, bring it north-south, and it would open up a couple acres of developable commercial property along Main Street. And the offer you make to purchase it was pretty reasonable, basically the same offer we're making on that roof on. But that would be possible for us to retail. Another conversation we need to have at some point. That would be right over here. Yep, right, off, right along Main Street. Yep. Cool. And then the board sets some long term uh, maintenance plan for infrastructure and marketing, move truck route. I've heard that many times, but without that light panel 34, this would be hard to do. Front Street improvements, a couple years ago, I mean with all the owners along Front Street, kind of give them a history. A lot of them didn't know that we paid the Union Pacific about seven, eight thousand a year just to keep that road open for them. We have to lease the road because about half of it's in the right of way. Mm -hmm. 
But it's a horrible road, especially in the summer when we have torrential downpours. It's a mess. What about the extension of Front Street? That? Has anything happened yet? Not to my knowledge. I've not been contacted by C C dot EP on that or Will County. At the upper front of the range meeting a few weeks ago it wasn't brought up. So that's really a C dot county and flat will probably do it. And UP. And UP, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then the board and staff discussed just any ongoing priorities we just didn't forget. You know. Like we're talking tonight, capital improvement plan and prioritizing goals, long term funding sources, additional revenue options. I mentioned we may want to look at a sales tax or use tax uh, ballot issue for the people. Debt, maintain debt free uh, budget, positive reserve balance, unrestricted funds. We've been pretty good and lucky with the vehicle replacement program, but other equipment we have to consider replacing as well. Earlier this year, Mary got a screaming deal on a good use copier, which may not seem like much, but it's used all the time. So it works really well. We should probably spend any money on that. Um, sidewalks. Uh, David years ago went literally every block in town and, and did a, a priority list of, of sidewalks, you know, where they're at, where they're not, priorities of what, what need to be fixed before others. Sewer line collections. And again, a reminder: we always want to claim the slip line every year as possible again. We haven't since David has been here had any backups from the owners. We had one, okay. And then the street improvement pro projects. So this is the meat of tonight's meeting. 2019 priorities and projects. So I go by fun. I keep it as simple as possible. <laughs> Again, these are each each item as as I summarize. I like the board to provide input, discuss them. Some years the board will say, you know what, we have to do this. Try put that in the budget. Other years they say, well, finish your general fund first, and we'll see what numbers are there. That's why we're doing this now. So I don't surprise you after the general fund comes out next week. So the main priority in the sewer fund is, you know what. Wastewater treatment facility. I summarize the compliance schedule here. So currently, we've hired the consultant and, and we're looking at securing funding for planning aspects, which is what we're doing. Uh, next year, the PEL, David can define these in more detail, progress reports, and obtain funding for design and construction. And it's year by year, 2020. Funding plans have to be sent to CDOT basically, about CDOT, CDPHE. And then 2021, essentially the construction has to start. 2022, it has to be completed. What's the PEL, David? <clears throat> That's a preliminary effluent limit, is what it stands for. Um, and right now, with some of the discussion that we had with uh, JDA last week at our kickoff meeting for the um, for the updated wastewater utility plan that they're doing for us as part of this planning process that will help us meet that criteria by the end of the year. Um, the, I mean, we, we have obtained and under contract with the licensed engineering consultant and we have the funding to do it. So we've met that criteria. So we need to fire off that letter to the state saying we've done this and we're ahead of schedule. Um, but going back to the PELs, um, when it, if if the town was to ask for a larger wastewater treatment facility than what we currently have, and right now we're only at 50% hydraulic capacity, and we're right around the 50% mark on the organic cap capacity of the existing treatment facility, and we're permitted for 348,000 gallons per day for 0.348 MGD, million gallons per day. Um, they are gonna run the numbers and see where we're at, but at the historic growth rates of the last 10 years and projected growth rates for Platteville area, um, they're anticipating that we will not meet, or we will not exceed that existing capacity 
over the next 20 years, which is what they have to project for a new wastewater treatment facility. So if we don't exceed that, then they actually will, we get to skip this PEL step because we already have a new permit, so they don't have to give us a preliminary effluent limit for a projected permit. We already have a limit for a current permit that we're going to meet, and as long as we don't go over that 348,000 gallons per day. So they're going to they're gonna massage the numbers and look at the numbers in a lot of different ways and make sure that we have a, uh, a fudge factor built into those numbers as well. But they don't think that we're going to end up projecting enough growth to have to design a larger facility than what we're currently permitted for. So that's, that's probably a five to $8,000 savings, which in the scope of the whole thing is a huge, but every five to 8,000 bucks is five to 8,000 bucks. I don't care how you cut it. And are we permitted only for that 348,000 gallons, et cetera? That's our, that's our permits for, and that's what I was going to say. And they wouldn't be able to take on anymore. Correct. And, and then the state has two other safety factors built into those numbers. When they give you a permitted number, um, when you get to 80%, of your permitted number, then you have to start into the paper process of engineering and starting to design and figure out how you're going to expand or replace that facility. So and then when you get to 95%, you have to then be under construction at that point. Well, if that's the case, I was gonna ask you my next question, so thank you. Um, so in 20 years, do we not expect the growth of Platteville to be such that it would reach the 80% threshold of the um, permit, which would trigger a need to build another plant, or in less than 20 years, I guess, even more so than that. Mm -hmm. I know we're not on that track right now, but mm -hmm. with the way the county is growing, mm -hmm. it would be hard to see. I guess it, I, it depends on how the board acts and what happens. In the town in the next 15 years, but I could see it easily coming to fruition where that threshold is met before we get to the point where we're ready to build another plant. So, shouldn't we figure that into our planning for this plant that we will may need to want to handle 400,000 gallons or 450? Maybe not a, a huge up, but enough to give us a little bit of a buffer zone in case the town were to grow or that just spending money that we don't need to spend. And, and, and we spent probably an hour and a half on that exact topic the other day um, with the engineering company, because they want to do what the town wants them to do. They obviously don't want to come back to a plan, come back with a plan for us saying, well, we can get you and don't have to submit for new PELs and all that kind of thing. But part of what we looked at was the historic Platteville growth versus the historic Well County typical growth and Platteville growth is way less than the typical Will County growth. Um, the, the other thing they're doing is right now that the, the Uniform Plumbing Code says you'll, you'll use a number of 70 gallons of water per day per individual in a household. And the average number of people in a household is anywhere from 2.7 to 3.2. I haven't figured out how you get the 0.7 or the 0.2 people, but anyway, that's, that's what they, <laughs> they say the average number is. Um, so what they're, but Platteville's use has been 50 gallons a day versus the 70. So what they're doing is they're gonna go ahead and build the plant and build the projections based on the 70, even though our actuals have only been 50. And then they're going to build the plant capacity on the organic side, even though our, our, our BODs, biological oxygen demand coming into the plant has only been in the 280 to 320 range. They're gonna build it on a 400 because that's what they're starting to see, the concentrations of 400 milligrams per liter of BOD in other communities. And part of that is the low flush, high concentration, you get less water, but more, more, more food, more biologicals in there for the, for the bugs. Um, so they're, they're using those two fudge factors to start with into that. The other side of the coin is they also, Raptelus is, is their subcontractor and coming in and going to do a rate review and rate study on our investment fees and um, what it's going to take to pay the, 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 the financing for this 
once they figure out what this new new plant's going to cost. But part of what we're trying to do is project far enough that if we did have a, a, an increase in growth, I don't want to call it an explosion because I don't think the board's going to go for 3,500 new homes over 10 years kind of thing. But um, an increase in growth that would, that would push us towards that 80 or even that 95% number on the new plant. What the goal is, is the new plant will be modularized in such a way that it will be able to be added on to fairly easily. We're going to design the add-on as part of the initial design. We're going to figure out how to do that. So if we were to, say, 12 years down, 13 years, 15 years down the road, be at that 80% mark, <coughs> then we'll have had enough growth that that growth should be paying most of the way towards that next phase of the plant that would be added in order to handle that. And it's your opinion that the state would allow that sort of um, project to be done and not just make it build a, something from scratch. They would allow this kind of thing in the past. Correct. The modular sort Correct. of stuff. Yes. And part of the way to add to that is part of the conversation is based upon the rate study us current residents are going to have to pay for this. Certainly. So part of it is the initial 2011 study was based upon maximum build-out. So that cost, that plant, was for maximum capacity. Not what we have now, but basically double the size. At least double the size. So the conversation is based upon our growth pattern. And we look specifically, we look at West Farm, we talk about growing south and east, which is not going to happen, it's not practical, we can't service, but the growth is north. So we talked about who I've been contacted with, the property owners, their concepts of growth, their ideas, and not you know, get specifics, but from 34 to 36, that was a very good you know, idea of who owned that property and what they intend to do in the next 20 years, at least in conceptual. And is that going to meet our, our current threshold? So that's, you know, that's part of the whole conversation. I'm just looking at the whole county, because we're not winds, we're not fire stuff. No. And large part of the community, we look at the comprehensive plan. You know, slow, steady growth, bringing in more revenue. Yes. Massive growth, 2,000 homes, subdivisions. Yeah. So those are things that are all part of this plan to find out. And But the lifespan of this, of this new facility is 20 years. We'll probably go longer than that. But that's what you budget for. And if the growth's not going to be there 20 years, is a better pitch to our local residents and our seniors and our fixed income parents saying the money you're building is to pay for what you currently use, not for what someone else is going to finish do. That's a lot better sales pitch. So, but yeah, this is going to be a continued conversation the next four years because we're going to have more details, especially maybe four months when this plan is done. And that's going to be the first big information. So I'm going to be working on something for the community mayor requested me to do in the next few weeks to really break down details of this, this whole process and so the community is aware that I'm going to be surprised in the future when this comes kind of down the pike. So, so if I could just really, uh, yeah, the last thing I'd like to say on that, Spencer, is right now we have between seven and 800 rooftops in town. So if you say we're at 50% capacity with seven to 800 rooftops, you know, if we're if, if we end up having a subdivision go in where we get 50 rooftops a year out of that subdivision, you know, we're 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 14 years into the new plant before we're. I mean, we're probably 12 years into the new plant when we're getting close to that 80 percent number. And if we did have a subdivision, let's say we we're going to build even 100 homes, we can build that into our agreement with them that they're going to just in mind for Absolutely. the plan. Yeah, yeah the, the board has full control because everything in town other than West Orange or the Harris property on the side you buy it, and that's very restrictive. There's no utilities, and it costs a portion to get them across the 85 and, and EP. There are growth patterns to the north, and that's all, that all has to be annexed. And the board, the 
fault in the accusation agreement, not the, but the accusation agreement. You can require them that you will work in some money to help expand sewer if we have to. So you're really in a good position on that part. I think your point about the current citizens is well Well, I'm anxious to see the study because the initial numbers from the 2011 study, those were just rough estimates, were based upon that larger facility. So I'd be curious what a facility that would size that we currently need or have will be. I'd be curious to see that. So my staff recommendations, and when I say staff, usually that's me, myself, and I. Sometimes David and Carl. <laughs> um, we currently have in the budget that 230000 to change for that Lagoon Reserve. For um, We need that money. My recommendation is we use that this next year. We, we put in the budget where we go after either a dollar grant match for the planning and design, which is between four hundred and five hundred thousand dollar project. Or Liz Hunt at CDPHC says they have a, a grant, no match grant, of up to three hundred thousand, but that's not enough to complete it. So what I would like to from the board tonight is I'd like to put this two hundred thirty. Can we use the grant from CDPHC to match the door? No, no, we can't use two state funding sources. That, that, we, we tried that. That's a good idea, but state funds can't not match state funds. But if we have that 230 and we are able to get the 300 from CDPHG, we'd be okay. Um, yeah, and I'm shooting, from my perspective, I'd rather get CDPHG. I mean, CDPHG and Dole are, are intertwined, okay? Mm -hmm. But CDPHG, this is a direct process through them. I'd rather get the money from them because then I don't have to go after Dole after request Dole again for a million dollar grant to help build it again. I so agree. that's what we're trying to do. And we'll continue, you know, obviously we need to increase base rates. We don't know what that is yet, but we need to build our cash reserves and our with our uh, Colorado Trust reserves. So right now in the budget as of this past financials. There's our fund balance and cash in the sewer fund and our sewer living reserve, our general sewer reserve period. And these are investment fees. These are restrictions, but it's all going to be used for a new plant because they can't be used for operations, but the new facility can be used for. So about $1.3 million are available currently. So we have about a million to put towards the construction. Yeah. In a perfect world, we could use about a quarter million to go after the a grant or CDPH funds to do the design. The other million, and I don't want to wipe this out. We still want to build up cash reserves. But definitely that close to half million and then some of our college trust money to go after that dollar grant. Because my optimistic goal is it's a five million dollar project. We can go after Dola and get a grant for one million with our money match that's two. We stay at three million and under. We don't have to bond it out to other people. We can do a direct loan from the CDPHC for 20 years. That's very low interest, almost zero percent. They have zero one two percent. I think we qualify for zero percent because of our size and our median household income. So we'll see. Uh, water fund. I always start with water, sewer, sewer, water, and streets. Just so you know, those are three big priorities. The last couple of years, we talked about increasing our water our water pressure in town. Steve Bethurst, engineer, came up with some designs some, and basically crunched some numbers and did some calculations. Again, this is really David's realm, but we have two six inch slides servicing the town for the water tank. It's a loop system. You know, I, I wish the master meter went right to the water tanks, and the water tanks fed the town. It doesn't work that way. But one process, one way is to uh, take out the two six inch lines and put in a one 12, 12 inch line or 14 inch line, which would increase the pressure to get fire flows that we sometimes miss. And just like the school facilities, uh, I think they have to put some pressure pump stations in there because they can't get, they can't get their fire flows. Yeah, they finally got that figured out. Yeah. That was good. So last year, there's a ballpark estimate about three quarter million dollar project. <laughs> we have it in there, but we, much wipe out our, <laughs> as you can see, it wiped out our, wa our water fund. This would be a dollar grant. 
timing. I can't be applying for big time tier two builder grants at the same time. Right now, wastewater is your priority. We can get by with this right now. And there's, they don't ask David to explain a little more. There, there's, a, there's a service line over at the old Shell gas station, which is Exxon, that we really need to replace at some point in the future. Yeah, we, we had a line that uh, um, haven't been able to explain it, haven't had any issues, but with back, bacterial issues or anything else on it. But uh, service line over in that area that had some root growth get into, which is really rare on a water line. Most people I've talked to have said they've never seen that before, so we're welcome to Plato. Um, the roots are growing in the water line. So uh, we, we, got, we got it. We, we retapped the line and, and eliminated the problem, but we don't know exactly where the problem came from, and this is an older line that probably um, the easiest solution would be to uh, dig it up and replace it. That, I shouldn't say the easiest, the most logical solution would be to dig it up and replace it. The second most logical solution would be to take that line out of service and potentially have it relined um, or something along those lines. I know City really does that. They dig them up on both ends and um, go through, clean them, and, and then send a, a, a system through there that actually spins and, and uh, relines the pipe with, uh, uh, I believe it's a concrete type mixture that ends up in there. Then they have to go back and retap every surface line on there and, and those kinds of things. So um, there's a uh, couple of different options. Don't have any dollar values associated with either one yet, um, but it is something that had come to light last year and we had thrown it on the list as something that we need to not forget about. The 620 available funds, that's just for sole use of water. Yeah, that's what's based in the bank now, just for the, the water fund. What we, at the end of the year, what I typically like to do with David Green is we look at general fund cash balance, water sewer fund cash balance, and what it's going to take to maintain operations. Take the excess and stay at the call of trust so we can get some extra software. So what's a typical year? water servicing costs. I don't know the top of my head, but it's probably $800,000. Is that yeah. that much? The, 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 oh, the sorry, operation is going to be a big infrastructure. Um, <coughs> you know, without without having... That's a good question. I didn't bring my budget book in. But, but that fund's going to get used up just to pay for all the stuff you're going to need for next year. Operation. I, I was thinking operations are close to a, to half a million, but I could be wrong. Yes, with that, Spencer. So yes and no. I mean, right now people are still irrigating, and once that stops, those those revenues that come in the water fund will start decreasing. So, and, but most of the expenditures have been spent this year. So you have to look at the whole picture. So yeah. this may be our balance at the end of the year. It depends if revenue still offsets the expenditures of the rest of the year. I guess what he's saying is we don't have money. The 620 is not available to spend because it's we have to use it for operations. Yes. I think he's based on like not to spend this money. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I get it. We get need to keep it. Yeah. Streets and highways. For good reason, I put Reynolds Avenue reconstruction project as a top priority. I, I assume the board would agree with that based upon conversations in the recent years. This number from last week's conversation with Steve Affairs, he updated the numbers. He's been updating numbers on Reynolds Avenue since 2012 for me. <laughs> they keep going up? And they keep going they up. They keep going up, <laughs> but I know it's a priority, but I, it's just at some point, this, this year needs to be the point where we have to start phasing it. We really do. There's other streets we need to talk about, but on this one, this is my suggestion. It's about a one and a half million dollar project. Now granted, there's it's really about a one point two million dollar project, but it's built in contingencies and in engineering fees and blah blah blah. I had the specific breakdown in my office, I can get to the board. So my suggestion is that's gonna be hundred and fifty thousand alone just to do the construction, design, and engineering survey. That's a ballpark estimate. 
And Steve's usually been pretty good over the years on estimating that ride. Okay. So about 1.5 again. I inflate these numbers a little bit. And I do that on purpose. You're looking at about six to seven hundred thousand dollars if you break it up within two years. And the Steve was Steve would have we talked about this. He's gonna have to give me some detail if we get the board to decide to do this. But one idea is to do the first six months of 2019, do the design engineering surveying, and then seeing what money is available can they start doing. And this is based upon a retention pond or detention pond between Reynolds Avenue and the Horseshoe Pitch. Not the whole parking lot, just from the Horseshoe Pitch and then South of Reynolds, just that, that small area. Because otherwise, you're going to double this number if you put in the storm drain all the way up to 32 and a half and up the river. That's just not feasible. And we're also looking at expanding the existing pond and, and hoping to double it behind the community center using that, utilizing it to the most capacity. Yes, Dave? I was just thinking, it, 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 it may be a combination of two ponds, it may be one deeper one either by the ball fields or by the ball the door she gets steve's looking into both scenarios yeah. and i've heard comments that you know what a couple years ago we we paid the same length of stretch of road three two and a half just paid rentals you're going to flood houses if you pay favor of that from there you will i guarantee you i live down there yeah. last year alone pink garcia's house it came up almost to his front door and that was just for an hour hard hard day of rain. So I won't take that chance. So the cheapest way to go is another small retention pond. We don't increase the ones in the ball field parking lot because those, those are really just for the ball field parking lot. But they're picking up water off the rails right now. Mm -hmm. And then the one behind the community center, right behind that east ball field, there's a kind of pizza angle incorporate all that and expand it all into the, that retention pond and basically double that size capacity and I'll fence it for security. For safety. Um, with detention ponds, I've seen a lot of places zone them for parks. Yep. Can we? Well, that's one idea is if we expand and double that retention pond back there, we can saw and irrigate the bottom of it. It could be a practice field or two small practice fields with backstops. You won't be chasing baseball very far. The, back of the, the, the walls would be a four to one slope, it'd be easy to get them down. But that's, we want to utilize the, the smaller one, though, it won't be too small. It won't be a lot bigger than what's already in the wall for the parking lot. Well, if, if we have to go down by the horseshoe pits, Adrian, we have to get so deep that we're going to be we're going to be almost 10 foot deep in there. So that'll be perfect for the foam slip inside. There you go. <laughs> with the with the ladder to get out. That's the kind of so the design and, and engineer <coughs> will formulate a plan where we need to have a drainage. So are you guys David and you work with them as to what you guys think they should do? We should put it and they'll ultimately say yes, yay or nay. I don't know what they need to say. The original 1992 plan, Spencer called for all the drainage to go to a detention pond basically behind the east field, or the east field wasn't there at the time. So he had called for a detention pond in there. So if we can use that concept, we might be able to keep it a little bit shallower if we can get enough volume in that, in that area to the northeast corner of the east field. So I think that if we can get the volume there and if we can prove in an infiltration test to the state that we would infiltrate fast enough through the sand and gravel in that area that we won't retain water for more than 72 hours, then we might be able to put in a detention pond with a groundwater discharge. But that that is dependent on that being that the infiltration test shows us that we can do that. If we have to go down by the horseshoe pits, we have to be deeper, and then part of our discharge there is going to be having to actually pump it back up and into the river storm drain system to get it out. Good question. This proposed project 
goes from Main Street all the way west to River. To River. Correct. Right? River. Okay, yes. <coughs> so basically, the remember what Steve said from the entrance of the ball fields mm -hmm. to Main, the retention pond expansion behind the community center would pick up that water body. Then the short stretch from the entrance, basically from Reed Road over the river, would, the other small one would pick that up. And that road will have to be, it won't be a straight flat road. It'll have some swells in it. So it would get the water to flow because it's so flat down there. And that's curb gutter and sidewalk the entire length. Curb gutter and sidewalk. On one side. Sidewalk, curb and gutter on the south side, on the residential side. And there would be basically, uh, really no, basically a, a small curb basically along the other side. But ditches, the side ditches on both sides to bring water down or just on the south side? Storm drain would be on the south side. And it'll actually be piped. Yep, it'll be piped. That's the only way to get it to flow. So at the very least, uh, and again, we again, this is why we had this conversation early on because definitely want to do the design engineering survey, but I don't know what pot of money will come out of yet. I'm thinking general fund. I don't know that yet. We have to get through the whole process. But what I'm going to do is tomorrow I'm going to send paper copies of this home with you, and then when you get the general fund or on Friday, when you get the actual budget with the general fund, you'll be able to put numbers together so we can have a livelier conversation next time around. So 2020, we have to figure, we, we're going to do a plan, we have to figure out the money to pay for the sewer lagoon. Okay. And actually, this will be 2021. Okay. This will be two huge projects in a very short amount of time. But you can't use sewer funds. Right. right. So we're looking at different funds here. And you can't use Dolma on roads. This is not a truck route. So yeah, I'm not going to use a truck route to get Dolma driven. They I suggested were, that. But. They would not buy it. Okay. <laughs> and just in the, also the last couple of years, you know, we when we did about three, four, four years ago now, when we did Sturgill Boulevard from Old Homestead to the Sewer Lagoon, it was actually the whole stretch of Grand Avenue that, that was analyzed. So we try to break up in phases. So the next phase, when we get to that, would be from the curve at the retention pond at Stevens Circle to US 85. Again, these are some estimated numbers that Mr. Batheris gave me. Uh, these, you know, this one was 500,000, already increased to 550. Because I, it's already been two years old, three years old. And then the third phase of that was from 85 up to the end of the cemetery. And that estimate, and this is for reconstruction, not just patching chips, so these are truck routes. Chips that won't last. Mm -hmm. So that's three hundred fifty thousand dollars. These are both possible dollar grant matches because they're truck routes. Because the circle project was a dollar grant. Again, I can't just without dollar. Well, we've already said we're only going to go after dollar for sewer. That's just it. Is that, so is that what we're deciding, right? You're only going to chase them for one thing. It's going to be sewer. You could do a couple things, but because I asked, they even asked Don Sandoval because they, they have quarterly applications generally on a good year, unless the governor takes all the severance tax money, like they did a few years back. But uh, there's 25 to 30 million dollars in the cycle that typically are available for funding. Quarterly. Yep. And, and the forecast next couple of years, depending on Proposition 112, is that it'll stay pretty strong. Proposition 112 goes through on the roof where that's going to get deflated drastically. The town that you see now, the revenues you see now, will go away. It will, I guarantee you. But uh, these, I'm going to keep on the list. They have to be addressed at some point. I'm not recommending them in 2019. I just can't right now. So, at least the design, engineering, and surveying. And there's three smaller projects that Dave and I have been talking about. Front Street is another project. I uh, just don't see us there yet. I got to work out deals with QP. A few years ago, we did meet with all the property owners here in this room. We, we grilled some cheeseburgers, and we just had a conversation about what that road involved. It was built back in 1989, and uh, the only improvements that they know they noticed it would have to be a partnership of some kind. 
and we're just not there yet. So, but I won't, I don't want to forget about it. But there's three smart projects I think need to be attention. Talking to David on Lincoln Avenue here, just down the block, there's a street that's half paved and has been for years. For about fifty thousand dollar estimate, I like to make the street whole. Words and where I'm sorry. Oh, 66,000. I like my number better. I do too. <laughs> but Lincoln Avenue down here. Uh, Just right before Reynolds. Yeah, there's Washington, Lincoln, and Reynolds. And that street's been half day for all these years. And I just, when I took over to town manager, I, my uh, first road I wanted paved was Salisbury by, by Ruby Park. It was half paved roads. I hate half paved roads. <laughs> so I know we have big projects, but there's money I like to finish off some of these smaller projects. So that's one of them. He's been up on very chill cemetery hill. That 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 crown is completely deteriorated. I don't think it's gonna last much longer. You need a big patch up there. Around 32, right when you crown over to the cemetery. It, that shoulder on the south side is just crumbling off. That's not gonna get any better. It's not even better up there. Yeah. We're gonna have to really dig down and put in some good sub subgrid. And then the third project, these are all estimated about 50,000. 32 and a half needs some work. We're not there yet. I'm hoping that somebody buys it, mines it, and they repay that road. I'm hoping. But that's a big dollar project. It's not a high priority right now. But I'm going to leave it on the screen. But if you drive out there at 21 and 32 and a half, <coughs> the intersection right there is the same thing. It's deteriorating. And it won't last another year, is my perspective. We will go all the way to 21. Yeah, we don't. 21's not ours, but we touched 21. 21's fine, because county was maintained that. 32 and a half is that's falling apart. And we we need to put a little bit of money into that. Probably nice. bring it back about 30, 40 feet, but those trucks will turn in there and there and those tires tear that asphalt up. So those are three projects I like to budget. Uh, probably the capital improvement fund. But um, well, that's that you away with just the intersection work. So this is just chip ceiling. Nope. This is two and a half, and that's just this the intersection. This is making Lincoln Avenue whole and doing large patch projects at the cemetery, I call the Cemetery Hill and the intersection of 32 and a half and 21. How likely is that property in West Farms to be sold? As promoted now as a residential development, in my personal opinion, unlikely. As a grand mine, grand, uh, mining operation, gravel mining, more likely. So can we ask them for that intersection? If it goes through, yeah. Is there even a prospective buyer for that property? Right? About two months ago, a guy came in, and it was one of his three properties he was looking at to purchase. It's just what's, it's not being offered for sale as a mining operation. It's being offered since it's been it's around a $22 million sale. But that's assuming you can build based on perhaps based upon what the original plan is, and you cannot do it. Yeah. You cannot build 2,200 homes out there. You can build maybe 1,000 homes up on the, on the bluff, like on the one for 21, but you cannot build down that bluff line. Not without FEMA. I don't see it happening. And that's a long, costly process. And what, how soon, realistically, would, if they were to buy it, would they be able to see any sort of improvements out of it? Two years? Next? If somebody buys in the next, say, three months, six months, and you're still a month, and probably you're out from that. And, the, and as far as gravel mining, the two companies or two individuals that I talked to, one the previous work year, last year, one this year, they both said it's based on supply and demand, just like the old Gilcrest Reservoir up here on, on Canada 38. It was mined hard heavy in 2004, 2005, and it stopped. It stopped for 10 years, or more than 10 years. Now, it got acquired again, and now they're going to start mining it. So, if somebody buys it and they, they want to start mining, the very first thing I tell you, is, and people that are interested, is you have to pay the road first. There's no way. First thing we do is just pay this road. Because in a month they may stop operations. We just don't know. But it probably wouldn't be prudent for us to forego this project on the hopes that it's going to get sold and we can ask them to pay. 
I am not optimistic in 2019. That's why I'm asking for some patching money because that's still a big pain. And I want people to point fingers. A lot of people use that road. Yeah. A lot of people use yeah. it. So. And then that's, I see your note, that's in a, these are addition to the, the general money we spend on patching and chips. Yep. Yep. And then then I was talking back in 2009-2010, when we started the capital improvement plan, we started a road maintenance program. We started with chip sewing and patching Little Vista, we did some slurry silver and old homestead on his farm. And the intent is every seven, ten years you need to redo or revisit those streets. And we're at that point. I'm not saying 2019, but at least next year we can start instead of doing a hundred fifty dollars in patching projects. Go back to Bella Vista and work on that. Or go to Old Homestead and work on that. Because otherwise, it's, it's going to get to the point where we started, so we're throwing money out the window. That's my perspective. You can't let the road deteriorate, fix them, and then wait so long where they deteriorate again when they need more work than they finish the year. So, uh, so, my proposal is budget the design of the three patching projects and the capital improvement fund. And looking at Current fund balance. I talked to Gola today, Robert Thompson. Uh, last week they, they deposited a check for $102,000 into the bank, so that finishes out the senior center project. So we'll roll over a decent fund balance, and we're going to get between 225 and 250 in revenue anticipated. It's like this year in revenue in sales tax. So. Um, the funds typically that can be used for this capital improvement fund, which is annual revenues come in from sales tax, or the transportation fund, and that's one time for money that comes on impact use. So once you use that $176,000, once the growth comes in, it's gone. It doesn't get replenished. That's why you don't touch those first, those are last. This transportation fund money, that could be money set aside or be used for rental revenue. Kind of the 150 could come out of this pot of money, technically, for the design. And then we would just use the capital improvement fund for the, the additional 300,000 that we're talking about for these three projects plus your 150. What's your, what are you thinking your number would be on the chip ceiling and patching? It's still be 150 like it's been the last three years, or? No, probably Bella Vista. Probably less than that, I think. Well, if we were just doing Bella Vista, I mean, I had run some numbers just <coughs> cursory uh, off of that. Because we'd already done those areas before, we know what the what the volumes were, ran them off of this year's numbers. Just for chip seal portion, we, we can probably do Bella Vista and the uh, the original, what I call the original part of town from Vasquez to Division all the way to Washington or to Reynolds um, for yeah, by the time you factor patching into it it's going to be 150 just the chip seals around 100, 108 I think it was but if you factor some patching into it yeah you're at 150 plus you've got some places in the town where the roads are giving up and you're going to have to <coughs> right I think yeah, you just had some basic right. patching. I mean, even over by Lincoln Park, even though we chips up that the previous year, right in the corner of Frank's, pl or Frank's place, and there's a pothole to go. There's some turning in there. You know, there's, there's always those things that happen. So we're looking at about 300000 for our roads projects this year. Yep. And that, those are small projects. I mean, that doesn't include, I mean, that's patching and design. Well, I guess it would actually be Four hundred and fifty thousand when you add in the design for the rental, right? And that's something when when we get one proposal is take the design out of the transportation fund and then use the majority of the capital from the fund for patching and chips. And that's one concept. Okay. I'm not really convinced that we should use the transportation fund yet, but if it's an important enough project, project, I think we're also be. I think it's knocking on that door. Yeah. yeah. It's pounding on the door. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Between the the youth sports parents and the seniors. I mean, 
those two groups are the most on that road besides people who live there. And it's tough. But you know, once we pay rental, they want us to pay the parking lot. Because I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Sidewalk fund. Uh, not much to do this year. I mean, one of our goals is to continue town-wide patching when money's available. This year we did a specific project. We did the, what they call the Valley Village Grand Avenue sidewalk, uh, which turned out pretty nice. Uh, a couple of projects we talked about over the years is we have basically handicapped ramps to nowhere because when you do certain street improvements, you're required by by law to put in the corner handicap ramps like we have over here on the division and grand. <coughs> So I split projects up, basically from Town Hall. No, sorry, this is on Grand Avenue. From Town Hall, just on the north side, over the river to A Grand Storage. I mean, there's no place to walk. So that would be a project. I don't have any budget numbers for it, so I'd like to pursue, not, not pursue the project, but I'd like to have a little bit of engineering money for Steve to put some numbers together. They're talking about on the north side of Grand. North side of Grand. So if you wanted to walk up there so and cross that river, you can you go north. east, west, and then it would it would tie into to eventually sidewalks on the river, which is close enough to connect. Reed, no, we have to build more sidewalks on Reed. And of course, there's nothing on the bid. But people who walk north and or east, west on Grand would have a connection, at least down the town hall and. There was a point where that ditch on the east side of the field, the west side of division, would be filled in and used for sidewalk parking, so on and so forth. Is that still a possibility? I know that's county, isn't it county? Um, is that county? Te technically it's county it is, yeah. and it's camp you know, yeah. We looked at that a couple of years ago, that culverting that ditch for parking, I, and actually, I think Thursday, Linda's called me today. Thursday, I've been with the new principal talking about parking over there. She has to be with me. Linda? Linda Deck. Oh, okay. So, is the ditch used? Well, the All ditch. The goes to the east side of Division. You mean? No. I mean, that, used with the ditch on the west side of Division is what the purpose is. It flows water to, to the 66. If that ditch gets really full. The, okay. the, 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 the valley pan crossing right there at uh, South Valley Middle School. Uh -huh. You're right. The the road she flows to the gutter, which is on the east side. Then it all flows north and south to that valley pan, and all of it goes to the ditch. Okay. Excuse me, and then the, okay. to the west side, and then back. So. Okay. Yeah, there's been times where on the on the heavy long term downpours where it's over that ditch almost broke out. Okay. It's crazy. Yeah. But uh, that would be a huge culvert to yeah. culvert. We, to that, yeah. But Adrian, you're correct. We did look at that with Steve at yeah, one point. Was this an option that we could? And because Platteville is so flat, yeah. it just I mean we would it would involve curb and gutter yeah. and roller clustering the road, doing the same type of thing that we're talking about at Realms. And so by the time by the time he even got a little ways into his explanation. I was worn out and sweaty, and said, there's no way we can afford this right now. Yeah. Sure. Okay, I'm so, just curious. Okay. The so, only other option I haven't pursued it yet is where that valley pan there at the middle school gym crosses the road, mm -hmm. continue straight west through Camp Farm to the river. Then that ditch won't be used. Mm -hmm. But that would be a whole separate conversation with this, with this, uh, this thing. So, just an idea. Mm -hmm. It would basically be a easement through that pasture. Right. As long as the water gets back to the river, the state doesn't get it. So, like a big culvert. Mm -hmm. Or an open ditch. Because I believe there was a conversation mm -hmm. years ago. The county said, yeah, you don't need to do a ditch. The county doesn't care what we do with that, but right. we have to have the drains right now. Right. What's the concern with the ditch? Well, if you flatten that, there's parking needed over there, sidewalks, so on and so forth. So the idea is if we didn't need the ditch, there would be more parking options. Angle parking possibly all the way down. All the way down. Or parallel parking, yeah, one or the other. It's certainly the lack of parking. Yeah. 
it's a huge issue. Now still the construction crews there, it's just <laughs> not good at all. They're coming to close. Yeah, terrific. Next week. <laughs> next week is close to reality. They're trying to finish up that gym. Mm -hmm. But I understand. <laughs> and then also the vision from where we did the project at Gitterson Division back north to uh, actually all the way down to Reynolds Avenue next to that's gonna be a bigger project. These, these are two projects that when CDOT comes out with some, some grant funding I can probably pursue with the A20 projects. The second. I thought you meant year 80 20. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 20 that's still far <laughs> enough out there. <laughs> so we're gonna have $76,000 in this fund? Maybe. Okay. Spencer, to answer your question, I think the question was what was our balance? If you look at the available funds, because of what we need to pay back this year to the capital improvement? This is an estimate. And I'm estimating what we're going to get in sidewalk maintenance funds in the next four months. What we're currently over in the budget. I'm right. anticipating we're going to have to borrow, quote unquote, we've done this before, money from the general fund, the capital improvement fund, to make the fund whole so it balances. And then the first four months of next year, we'll pay that money back from one fund to the other. So by doing that, we get about 70000 a year in the sovereign maintenance fund. So you're only looking at on a good year having 38000 available to do any sidewalk work. So my suggestion is go back and do some town wide patching and old town, or you can put that money toward Reynolds Avenue. So we owe thirty two thousand that we have to pay back. That's it. So that's my estimate. Yeah. And it's not really a payback. We're just we're not going to have enough money to to have a balanced budget in the sidewalk fund. So we're going to have to we can't be audited with that made of balance. So we're going to have to borrow against each other fund, balance it out, make it zero, and then the board can either decide that they're going to donate that money from one fund to the other, which I don't recommend, or you pay it back as the money starts building back up in 2019. Does the deficit due to the project we just had, that's where it comes from? Yeah. So we should essentially just sit on it, get to the bare minimum, and let it accrue this year so we have a hundred thousand dollars to play Well, with. and that's a good point. It's, it's, there's no critical needs. Don't budget anything. Out of the seventy thousand, you would have a hundred thousand dollars that would probably pay for the sidewalk project to run up. That aspect of the for twenty twenty one budget for twenty twenty budget. So there's different ways you can piece yeah. the pie here. Yeah. yeah, that sounds pretty. Good. The the only other potential sidewalk possibility is we've been in discussions with the fire department. Oh, that's right. About, they are putting a sidewalk, they're putting a, uh, a public meeting room in the south end of the new firehouse, which is north of us. We've got a spot that you can tie into the existing sidewalk right out here on the northeast corner of Town Hall's parking lot. And so we have talked about, in conjunction with them, uh, with us paying for the portion on the Town Hall side, would be to um, put kind of a meandering sidewalk away from the edge of Main Street up to and connect to theirs. So if you had too much parking for a public meeting that was going on in theirs, people could park here at Town Hall and walk up. Or at least that would give the people in the northern part of town, once they get to the edge of the fire department parking lot, they would be able to walk down and walk all the way into town then on a, on a concrete sidewalk. So that's the other portion that- I forgot about that one. That, that would be a 2020? That no, that could be, it could be a 19 project, depending on how fast the fire department moves on. So let me, let me, cost. let me ask Dave, I'm just going to go, let me ask Dave to see if we can, we usually calculate a square footage cost based upon local concrete guys. Mm -hmm. they, they're typically so much per square yard or square foot. So Dave just has to measure it, you know, we can come up with an estimate. So that probably might be your 38,000 for 2019. Is that a priority? <laughs> <laughs> to me, if, if another project is, is being built and you have the money to help make that project whole, you do it. There's been too many half-assed things on there. Yeah, that, you know, going back 
to the half streets. I think yeah. half streets. I don't like half sidewalks either. Well, we might be able to take advantage, Spencer, of an economy of scale if we have their contractor do it all at the same time. Yeah. Potentially. I'm not saying they, because they, the contractor that did our sidewalk out here, if he doesn't end up being their contractor, he may be able to do our portion for less than what theirs are, but maybe not, depending on, on the economy of scale. So. Plug facilities fund. Again, these are new, proposed, and pending. They all have been because some projects that I talked about previous years are no funding. I don't. I don't forget about it. I just keep them on the, on the list. Community center renovations. Talked about this this year. We did the roof and nothing much more. Dave and I talked to DTC. Uh, is it the engineering firm? D two C. Uh, they specialize in public facilities for fire, police, libraries, uh, so on and so forth. That's what they specialize in. So we talked to them about a couple of proposals. One is to do a master site plan at town hall. And then the second one is to do the renovation of the community center. I don't think we should pay them, or Dave and I could work directly with contractors to make one side look like the other side. I, I'm just taking a very simple approach. Get a hold of not to cut out the middleman, but I want to cut the middleman. Get a hold of the contractor that did the windows and doors of the senior center and see what it costs to do the community center. Get a hold of some contractor that did the floor and did the same thing. We can be the project manager. We don't need to pay for the overhead on that. So that's one thing I want to propose doing, but I need to get some estimates. Uh, so the money that you allotted last year for that wasn't based on an estimate? It no, it was based on what's available in the fund. That was conservative. We just let over 50000 but, uh, so that could be well. Yeah, I don't think it will be. <laughs> <laughs> Windows and doors alone will probably be pricey. But the thing with these subcontractors, when you do it to the general contractor, one thing you know, it's, and it's not that contractor specifically. Every contractor is different. There's a markup on every change order. There's a markup on every subcontract. I just want to take the markup out. I'm not a contractor. But this is a very simple, straightforward project. We're not building anything, we're just refurbishing what we have to make it look nice if people want to rent it. Um, talk about a new PV, these are just some high estimates. Again, this would have to be probably a dollar grant, so it's not a high priority. Sorry, Carl, but it's coming, it's just not there yet. We got too many other priorities. Expand the public works yard. So these are kind of tied together. So my recommendation is. Uh, there's a proposal from one engineer company. We need to get an, at least one or two other estimates, but take about 25000 and the board can actually work with this engineering company and do a master site plan for town. You can do the, you complete the entrance, put in the new PD, expand the yard, expand the shop, you do the fence. So we have a board you have an overall site plan that the board sets off. I mean, this, we're not piecemealing it. So I like that concept. Plus, I like to put money aside to get that community center renovated. Absolutely. So I don't know. I, I need to get some numbers yet. But definitely about twenty-five thousand for the uh, master site plan. Engineering just takes cost money. And then maybe I don't know fifty to seventy-five thousand. I'm hoping we'll do the community center. I don't know yet. So. So. Optimistically, eighty thousand dollars. That's going to come out of the general fund. Oops. Sorry. Right now, there's if all three sales go through, we have about seventy thousand in the flight facilities fund, and we'll have another two hundred thousand come in. So it'll be two hundred seventy thousand to double the flight facilities fund. So it'd be pretty good shape. So I'm thinking we. Reserve two hundred thousand, leave it in the bank. Use seventy thousand to do the master site plan and to update the community center. That's my proposal. Mm -hmm. Two hundred, we can reserve that for the master site plan and after that. Well, and, and there's there's more spokes to the wheel. The remaining two hundred thousand maybe could be used when we get to that point. It could be used on public works to expand the shop. We might set aside the park versus park department, which we haven't talked about. Where's that money go? Could be then reallocated for the new PD. 
So there's different ways of, I mean, there's a lot of moving parts to the budget. So that fire department money doesn't go into this um, public facilities fund? No, you still need to decide which one to do with that. My recommendation is we already said it's just making money. You just have to rename this purpose when you get to that point. Cool. Uh, vehicle fleet's pretty straightforward. These two CMAC vehicles for Dave and Carl are not going to be funded by CDOT. I just know it's not going to happen. At least. It would be prudent to not count on it. I'm not going to count on it. After that last upper front range meeting, the gentleman that took over the CMAC program called me and said, if you're doing, if you need a budgetary answer, the answer is no, you will not get it this year. You might get funding for it next year. I said, well, I can't wait that long. So he said, well, are there other vehicles in your fleet that you could replace as these vehicles to get the money still came through? And I said, we can figure that out. I'm not going to turn away money. But these two vehicles will need to be replaced. We're talking about the Crown Vic, which is currently being used by the SROs because it doesn't take much wear and tear and beating on the street. And then the Public Works Director's truck is the only one. We bought that new back in 05, basically off the floor. Uh, it was in my first year here. So and uh, remember the board buying at the time. Remember a long conversation that the board did not want anything electronic. They wanted the cranked windows and basic plain jam. By doing so, it's going to cost about five thousand more than the factory bill because <laughs> it's, a, it's a special order. <laughs> anymore, it so it was a big battle. I'll never forget that. <laughs> I don't know what. Well, nowadays it would cost more. Then it didn't cost more. Actually, yeah. it did in 05. They, they ended up buying yeah. one with the deluxe package on it because it was cheaper to yeah. buy that than it was to special order it with crank windows. Are you okay with power windows? They don't buy them. Thank you. No, you <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what are we looking at? So if Ryan can get any help on this, it's just you got to do it. We better not count on getting help. I'm not going to count on it. So what am I proposing is the write out the rest of you on that crown big, but uh, Carl, Carl and I have talked, he got a whole Kansas High Patrol. I mean, it, the different states, Wyoming, Texas, New Mexico, they have fleet replacement programs, but most of those, even DPD, Denver, they usually don't roll them out until 80 or 90,000 miles before they turn them in. And Kansas, Kansas does it in 49,000. Anyone else cheap out there, I mean, they maintain the program. They're very well maintained cars. They literally have a white glove inspection every month with every state trooper in that state. I used to have a friend who used to say that's the most dreading day of your life because it's just cool. They, they take off the filter and they get underneath and inspect it with flashlights. It's crazy. So, but is there a waiting list for those vehicles? Carl, you want to chime in on that one? Um, yeah, there's a waiting list. It, it depends on what we want, um, which It'd be nice if we had another SUV we can utilize in the winter and on the highway. That Yukon that we have now, or not the Yukon, mine. Oh, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, that thing's nice. It's uh, really nice in the snow, but if you need to hit the highway hard, I think it maxes out at 94 miles an hour, and you don't want to go much more than that anyway. So um, there's some available right now. If you wanted to, another charger um, that's available right now. And but then some of the other ones won't be available, they said, till the end of the year. I mean, which is fine, because they're not going to be available. But um, in the years past, they haven't had light bars on them and the radio in it, so we would have to go out there and run back with it, and then it would several weeks to get it all ready to rock, and um, light bar, radio, and all that stuff. So I guess it just kind of depends on um, what we wanted as to when it would be available. Do they have SUVs available or coming available? Yeah, so another one like mine, then they um they have a see it's a Ford interceptor. Yeah, the explorer but right, the exactly. police edition. There, there's a waiting list on those, but those are high demand. We can attach yeah, our name to it. Mm -hmm. And they, they would, would do pretty well as far as performance on the highway. Yeah, those well. those yep. I think those uh, those work out well. Um, what was the cost? Of all the what was the cost you picked up from? Uh, for the interceptor, it was right at uh, twenty four. If I want to get another Tahoe, that was right at nineteen mm -hmm. six, and the least expensive of all were the Chargers, and they were on 
16 lines. And 24, and how much are you looking at to get your outfitted with your lights and radio? Nine to eleven thousand dollars. Completely outfitted. Wow. Now, with that does said, like that, does, does it come with a Nintendo as well? <laughs> we have. Well, I mean, there's a lot of that stuff. That, um, the van has an old radio, and so a lot of that stuff we can use and reuse. Um, but how long is do they? How long is that stuff good for? Forever. I mean, as long as you want. It, like, I mean, we've reused no, the radio. Like the radio van, yeah. or uh, the, radio. the radio from the van. That's that's fine too. That's uh, that's one of the new radios that you guys authorized us to buy. Oh, okay. We uh, that new radio is, uh, is in the van, I believe. Um, and I could be a little high, um, but I thought just write it after you have to get light bar radio, the outsides. It depends on who you want. The light bar is the biggest. Can you yeah. take this stuff off the crown deck and put it on the intersection? The light bars on those, they're not made anymore. So okay. if anything goes wrong with them, yeah, that's, it's, it's kind that's of a scam. Kind of they'll, right. they'll make sure that they can't. Wait, that was the lesson. Mm -hmm. yeah, years ago, when I first came up with my car, I used to go out and ask other departments for these light bars just to save money. I had to spend more money because they go out so fast you can't be replaced with cars. You actually save more money just buying a new one because it lasts the uh, most maintenance. And wireless advanced may have some nice used items that we can maybe uh, invest in to get a whole the whole thing for seven thousand, eight thousand. But I know uh, what their last card was after everything, right? At, I think nine nine thousand. That also includes your decals and stuff. Yep, right? that's everything. So, that's ready to rock on the road. So best case scenario, we would get the intersection. So if, if your car was buying a police car for the Platteville Police Department, you would prefer to have an interceptor. Yeah, I mean, um, you read reviews and you ask other officers, and some of them love them, some of them not. Some of them don't like the Chargers, some of them love them. But um, I've got, with the highways that we have here, I think in all wheel would be the best. Smartest. Smartest. They could make a deal on a red Mercedes convertible. <laughs> 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 could be the unmarked. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that for Santa Claus. <laughs> oh. <laughs> He's been thinking about it already. You may have volunteered more. How do you put the light bar on the convertible part? That's the only thing I'm not sure. Oh, about. yeah. With enough engineering, you could do a damn near anything. <laughs> so now on to the more important vehicle. I'm not sure it's but um, this public works director's pickup trucks. Mm -hmm. Well, real quick, going back to the, the police unit, my recommendation is in you know, law enforcement equipment training, um, we, we put with them, that fund is on general fund, it's special fund for this specific purpose. Um, budget up to 35000 which will cover cost of purchase and equipment, and get on the waiting list right away. And purchase in January, February, once that vehicle comes in. Yes, sir. works vehicle, I don't have such a program for public works, so. <laughs> <laughs> David? Can we take five? Yeah, let's take five. Why not? Thank you. We're almost done with this, with this work. Mm -hmm. Public works issues. David, you're going to be out to sell the bills and cook on the table on your truck. Is there a used fleet of have to chase anybody um, down? This type of stuff as well? Just keep going to work. Okay, thank you. You've got a blood pressure on the pulse. Right. So, what's a good sign? I have not been on the I'm just kind of So, I can go I don't know of a, I mean, you can buy used trucks from the state of Colorado, you can use trucks from the city of Lowell, the city of Fort Collins, Lerner County, Lowell County, they all, but they've all got 
pushing 90 to 120,000 miles on all of them. So it's like, what kind of headache do we track by? Right. So um, we can go on the state bid, which gives us specific items. I go in and bid out a specific truck, specific options, and they have they give them a bid. They and we can get it down to a specific dollar value. Mm -hmm. um, if this money is allocated this year for January 1st, and I was going to go over this for all the board, but um, you know, one of my thoughts is when we write our spec for the pickup, we go ahead and allow for a 2018 unit that they might have discontinued and be trying to discount it off their lot. Okay. So we might be able to. So rather than spec a 2019 unit, we will spec it as a new, right. but we will accept a 2018 that meets all this criteria like as long as the discount rate is enough. So we got a vendor that's out there who wants to opt this for, you know, I mean, I've seen it happen where Kevin Darko ordered 32 trucks, and then the guy that was supposed to have truck number 32 wanted gray instead of white for whatever. And so now they've got this fleet truck sitting there that they're willing to discount just to get it off the lot. Okay, David, it does this, but it doesn't do that. We wanted this, but, it, you know, you, you know, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And see what kind of a deal we can get. Or we just go to the state bid in 2019 and we pick it out and we go, okay, you know, we're out of here, we're back out of the What was the last truck we bought? That we paid full price for? Yeah. This one, the one I'm driving. Wow. Now, the 2005. Now we've got two 2014s. We've got a 2000. You know, we've, got, we've got a 2015, two 2014s, and we've got a 2012 that were all purchased on the CMAC. Uh, so we've got we've, we've got 200 thousand dollars. I mean, all of those were 50 plus thousand, mm -hmm. and we paid less than 10 thousand dollars each. So, so that's why we've been holding out for the CMAC money. So hopefully, right. it, it, you know, yeah. Is that my, my, that my, my, my truck, the pickup I've got, it's been in the shop, it's had some transmission issues. But it's only 118, 119,000 miles. So it's not way up there. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't want to, I, I think it's too good of a truck to get rid of yet. Okay. But we're going to have a new rec director on staff next year. There might be, there's times where if we do have a seasonal helping us out or something like that in the full course department where we really don't have enough vehicles to try and get them. If we've got them doing a project at the cemetery and this and that, then we've got somebody driving the dump truck as a work truck. So he's throwing all the tools in the front seat because he's got a really toolbox on the vehicle. vehicle. So he, 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 yeah, yeah, I'm still trying to this guy in that, but yes, that's uh, that's my argument. <laughs> One idea that came up, and you know, I'm not not because I don't like your thing. It's just to transition you into one of the 2015 trucks that we moved to 2005 and uh, daily. And we and see, and I, I I I had the option of taking the 2015, mm -hmm. um, but we built it as a snow truck, as a snow park. Yeah, and so we we in, we did that intentionally. I. You know, there's a lot of bosses that they want the newest and latest and greatest, and they put the oldest one back in. Wait, I, I didn't operate under that theory. Right. I, I've been operating under the theory. Let's make sure the guys have the equipment they need, and I'll, I'll figure out what I need to do here. Now, we are looking at a three-quarter ton pickup because we want to be able to put it eventually into the fleet. If you know, we have it for a few years and we need to do something else or sure. whatever. I mean, I, I mentioned the idea of maybe downsizing and going to a more, uh, you know, a, 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 an all-wheel drive, smaller mid-size SUV or something like that, but I don't know, or whatever, but, you know, I mean, that just doesn't really fit the public works fleet. Right. To have a Honda CRV or something like that. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. So, cool. so um, yeah, so that's part of where and, and that 45000 we hope to buy the truck, plus that includes our decaling, our light bars, et cetera, as well. Because yeah. we, we've got to make it safe to sit on the side of the road during a snowstorm or sort of during a water leak or whatever. Have you 
ever had a close look, let's take two minutes. I'll run you out and show you these other trucks real quick. And then we'll hit the bathroom on the way back. And I'll just have to wait until we get here. Perfect. <laughs> Everybody left yet? No. This boat. We have, been, we have an early meeting in the morning, don't forget. It's going to be a, a late one, it would be suspected. There's this, this, and then. I guess it depends on salary, yeah, conversation for salary, but uh, this is going to be the initial conversation about uh, anticipating those decisions. They're going to need to know what the general fund is that we have to balance. Yeah, that's why Colt and others never show they know the, uh, that the initial meeting is just kind of a um, once over layout. I know Troy was leaving, I think, tomorrow. They're going to go to. They're going to Germany, I can't remember. To go see Jay. Is that where he's at? Oh, he's here. He served his uh, six months in Iraq, first thing, right out the gate. And then once his tour's over, and once he's in, he's stationed in Germany for the remainder of his. Three and a half years. Not bad year. No. Married? Get, be, get married. Maybe this is his way. I can't remember which one it is. Maybe if this is his way, I'm not sure. Yeah. 
Everybody's ready for a break. The boys are texting me. Can we have cake? I'm still working. Can we have cake? We need some bread. We'll wrap it up in the morning. That seems our goal. What do you think? I try not to think. This is a skull crap. <laughs> now, Larry, come on.
Adley doesn't really need a vehicle a whole lot, but I know uh, on occasion we use it for training where I can use it if it is available. Plus, if we end up hiring, I want to hire a still part time code enforcement officer to be a dual use vehicle. I can't see buying one vehicle for either or, but having a vehicle that's multi use makes a lot of sense to me, in my opinion. And that you don't envision that being David Holden's truck? No. Because it's having transmission issues as well. I just I don't want to take that gamble. I don't want to drop three grand, four grand of training on an old truck. Initially, I thought that way, Spencer, but in the last six months, I've seen over Mike's auto and I know why. So, you want to romp on it so hard, it's probably be okay. <laughs> One idea is, is when money's available, I'm not sure what fund is, is to start setting aside 50000 a year and, and build, put that money in college for us. So when we need, do need to buy a, a backhoe, be first, street speaker will be second. Maybe in two years, buy a backhoe. Maybe in four years, buy a street speaker. How much are we putting in the street speaker annually right now? Yeah. Well, we, we set aside at least $10,000 a year for miscellaneous parts, just wear items on it, Adrian. The brooms, the 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 uh, elevator lifters that lift it, 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 all the dirt and debris into the back, that kind of thing. At least ten thousand items. But that it doesn't matter whether we buy a brand new one. We're going to be setting that because those are wear items. Those are parts that are are going out. Okay. The guys have been taking. It, we haven't had any major significant items go out on it that aren't necessarily a planned wear item. The, the hydraulic motors that run the brooms, those are, you know, we, we pay four or five hundred dollars a piece for those and we replace them every two or three years because it's just a nasty environment that they live in and they just don't live very long there. Okay. So. Okay. The thing with the street sweepers, my dad used to, to drive basically this the same type of the year, the model older street sweeper. And you know, he used to swear by it, and it's a good machine, but it takes forever to clean it. It's got way too many parts. And I, I just, to me, if we replaced it with another used reliable one, that smaller one, like the LJ, I, I go to these, when I go to trainings and meetings, like in Denver, in bigger cities, they seem to sweep the streets with these smaller compact sweepers. They have to dump more often, but they're 10 times faster. They sweep better, in my opinion. And I just think it's more practical because we're doing all these road work projects, including our road, we gotta keep them clean. That's my opinion. One thing David and I talked about is next year, letting the community know that, you know, the fourth Friday, the third Monday, whatever, that is the day that we're gonna sweep all the streets. Mm -hmm. Move your vehicles for one day so we can at least sweep all the curb and gutters, get the leaves picked up, the debris picked up. Most towns will do that. They do. I think if we ask the community one day a week, we do practical, you know. Um, so your note here, the CMAC, CMAC grant fund will likely not be used for vehicles in the future. Why is that? that was, they so, told you? During the upper front range meeting, I mean, they just did a, a, what's called a call for projects. There's seven, eight hundred thousand available. They made it very clear that you could not apply for vehicles any longer. And at that meeting of, earlier this month, Commissioner Kirkmar from Lowell County said, well, that's a lot of money, but when you look at what the money can be used for, for like the park, uh, Essence Park parking garage, they use the money for that. It's a big project. Um, Lumber County has some big projects, so it's it's, it's, it's air mitigation projects. So they could do signage, you can do sidewalk projects, you can do uh, storm drain, not storm drain, but pedestrian projects. So they're just transitioning it away from vehicles. away from vehicles. And they see that with the Federal Highway Administration, that being long term. Mm -hmm. So they said. Is that primarily due to the Buy America waiver? Buy America waiver, which is just a roundabout argument because we buy Ford, Chevy, Dodge, but such a high percentage of parts comes from overseas, they don't meet the Buy America federal standards. Toyota also does it better than the yep. So we just can't meet those standards. I'm sorry, but. So with that said, uh, Carl gave me his budget for law enforcement tra equipment training fund. So in that fund, uh, it's based upon surcharge from tickets, which is the majority of it, and then also portions of the Gilcrest law enforcement contract and the school contract. 
So but Carl put some money in there for other expenditures, but right now I'm estimating about 80,000 roughly available next year. So I think that would easily cover his vehicle. Wire sewer funds, uh, I, shoot, I show the overall balances above. You'll see that next week in, on budget form. The general funds to be determined. I have to finish that in the next two days. So, but you can have a ton in the water fund, if I remember right, and the sewer fund is not as tightly spent as one could get, right? I think what you saw are money that's really not being used outside of revenues and expenditures. I think when we might work with David that we could plug his truck in a water and sewer fund without dipping into the reserve, just using part of the operation. So I'll just have to show you that when the budget comes out. Uh, parks. Uh, Rogers Farm Improvements, that's been paying for a couple of years. Uh, nobody really bid on that project when David put it out earlier this year. I still think we need to do some, some new sod and soil around the basketball court and along that stretches of Circle Boulevard. It was bad. It just it's incomplete. So I want to continue working on that. Uh, that some, includes the sprinklers. Uh, yep. Yep. So that number just sits there because we don't know a good true estimate yet. So that's kind of pending at this moment. A couple years ago, we talked about building up basically on the Cornell Park on Bella Vista. There's a ditch that runs through there. There's a tiny little parking area to pull into. We worked with Steve there, so he came up with some, some estimates to work with Steve out to covert the ditch just in that section of park. So you could put in about 12 to 15 cars of angled parking, build a new entrance so you, you go, one would be an exit, one would be an entrance. Or entrance. It would be enough for a, a team, like a coach stitch team, a t-ball team to practice with the, you know, with that side of the team with about a dozen, 15 cars. We could resaw the, because the whole retention pond at Bella Vista is irrigated. So we could resaw the bottom of the retention pond. It already has a backstop. We could put in some small benches. I mean, it'd be a nice little practice facility. So we utilize, again, another retention pond. But uh, most of this money would be for correct me if I'm wrong, David, but we're going to see how to put that culvert in and, and cover that culvert along that main street. Well, that yeah, that included the get the culvert in, but then the material to haul in because we had to fill some, and, yeah. and then um, we were hoping to use old millings that we have out here beside Town Hall. Yeah, that didn't to, that, that, that didn't include. I mean, that included putting some kind of road base or milling down, it was not a paved parking area. But this recycled asphalt we have out there, that's the, the good pile over here north, the town hall over along that residential, that's what we reserve that for. So that's one project to consider. Uh, for a number of years, we the board has thrown around the idea of putting a small playground or some kind of amenities down at the community center of the complex because there's just nothing for the little kids to do during ball games, or especially during community center rentals. What happened is all the adults will stay in there, and the kids will go run on the ball fields and trash the place. That's just that's just the truth. That's how it works. Put them on the dugouts, put them on the parking lot, they'll throw rocks, and there's nothing for them to do. I just can't figure out the best place to put. I just don't know where. And then I know Spencer, you talked about. And I've been talking to David earlier about that playground Lincoln Park about replacing the roof. We reached out to Miracle Recreation, and, and I have another contractor that has another company that did the uh, shelter at the memorial and also did the shelter and playground at Riverview. I just don't have numbers back for the. Uh, so since there's a, that needs to be replaced, and it's a good central part of town, and the museum and the library there, is that a good place to look at a Flashback. Could be. Could be. I mean, dimension wise, it probably could fit. Mm -hmm. you know? And I, I didn't put the splash pad or the extra practice fields on this at this time. I mean, this is a draft. Mm -hmm. So if we could utilize like Bella Vista 
as it, as it practice. So we use a lot of the, the area north of the community center as a practice field. Use what we already have, mm -hmm. and those are nice, safe areas. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could even, even at Bella Vista, you take the dirt out and leave, or the grass out and leave the dirt, you just have to maintain it. It's much more maintenance when you do it that way. Mm -hmm. You got weeds and you it a lot. But, right. So right uh, now we have three, three fields yeah. in town to practice on. The two at the community center and then the middle school. The middle school. Yeah. You could probably do something at Riverview Park as well, being on the backstop. So years ago we took out two old tiny backstops because they were trashed. They were trashed and they were they were getting jagged on the middle. They were pet people. I pulled them out. I told Gordon that over on the on the south east corner. So the same side of the park as the skate park, the opposite corner, you put a middle of the little black stop in there for T ball to practice. And that part is sufficient. And that one cost a whole lot of money. I just don't have those numbers yet for the little tiny back stop back over there. Something so, that's been brought up to me a couple times by some people in the community is um, permanent restroom facilities some of our parks? I'd love to. Well, I mean, at Lincoln and Rogers Farm come to mind as two that we could use it. I'm sure they all could. I'd say Lincoln and Riverview because those are more public parks. Yeah. Cor uh, well, Coronado and Rogers are more subdivision parks, mm -hmm. even though they're open to the public. But Lincoln, I think, would be number one. Coronado, or sorry, Riverview would be number two. And then all the time the port party is flipped over at Lincoln Park. I know it's been removed now, which is crude, but what's the, any idea what it would cost to do there? Yeah. Uh, I, what about lights? Yeah. I have a feeling a lot of it happens because it's so dark over there. Yeah, and I had talked to Mike Evans already about giving me an estimate to install some lights over by the dog park and the horseshoe area pit because it's pitch black over there. We installed the two extra lights at the ball field two years ago. It's really lighted up. It's reduced issues in the dugouts. But that one light, kind of somewhat by the old shelter at Lincoln Park, is worthless. So that could be part of the redesign, basically. Mm -hmm. that's more lighting. So go further with new parts, not updating existing parts? To my understanding, yes. But I can reach out to GoCo and see if it's funny for replacement equipment. But if you took out the old, the hypothetically, you took out the old playground and you put a brand new. That's a design. That's a new facility. Yeah. And you splash, that would be a whole new facility. Yeah. And you could still add some features down there, like a yeah. swing or slip or slide, just like you did rear view. Mm -hmm. So you still use it you know, year round, basically. Weather permitting. Um, Recommendations, I think Rogers Farm Park really needs to be done. I don't have numbers yet. And then start looking at some playground upgrades at Lincoln Park or look at a splash pad. I mean, those are kind of open ideas for the board thinking about. That's why we do this early, like I said. You know. um, park fund, it's an impact fee fund. So without development, it virtually nothing in there except for replacing bits and pieces of equipment. Use tax fund, again, we need some more building because that's, that's building permits. I'm looking at a possible 90,000 available, most revenues coming next year. And then conservation trust fund. We started going away from the conservation trust fund because it only brings in around 26,000 a year. We usually use it for Tree City USA, about 10,000 a year for ball field maintenance, so we don't use general fund. And then we also uh, use it for part of our mowing. Or we used to, but uh, again, I'm going to give you this, and then when you get your budget, you're going to be able to plug in place kind of numbers where you see money going. We'll go down with these stuff. But parks is kind of wide open right now. I don't, other than Rogers Farm, I just that's an incomplete project. I think we should get it done. And that was how much? About forty-five thousand, and that has been budgeted the last two years in the use tax fund. Yep. And that's, that's the most prevalent fund we have. So what do you do when you can't get a bid on it? Do you just hire somebody to pay for it? Well, we've got, uh, we, we put it out to bid twice, didn't get any response at all. Um, so we have 
talk to a local individual um, who is supposed to be putting together some numbers for us. It's a much larger project than he's used to tackling, so he's uh, he, he's wanting to be real careful and make sure that he doesn't get hurt in the process and that he, he does a fair job for the town. Um, so, and at this point, it's so late. I, I don't think we want to try and put sod in there when I'm getting ready to blow out sprinkler systems in the next three weeks to a month. So, um, it, it's going to have to be a next spring type project anyway. So, he's got some time to get us some numbers. But, yeah, basically. And really, the last one on, the, on this sheet is the cemetery. And this, we put some money, about 25000 in. Uh, the use tax fund to once the memorial is built, we talked about doing some some nice stone pillars at the entrance, at the gate. I uh, just never got to that point. Other things came up. Uh, need to actually get a, a true hard estimate. Uh, just is money available? But I think the priority really should be because we're down to probably less than 200 grave sites left. I'd say 150. Yeah, I think we're still in. Yeah, close to 200 left. I think I need, we need to talk to Mr. Bethers and look at some estimate on surveying and start planning the new section of the cemetery. I don't want to wait too much longer on that. So we'll bring back some numbers on that. The cemetery fund has been pretty stable the last few years. It used to not be, but looking today, again, this is estimates of anticipated revenues minus expenditures to offset the operations. Uh, there could be some money available to that, and then of course the use tax fund is dipped into multiple reasons, obviously, and it can be based upon what's allowed. So, how many do we average burials per year? Like a burial day, though. Small project. It it's so hard to say, and I don't have that number. We have I'd a, say 40 to 50, I, and but that a lot includes, of them are cremated. cremated. <coughs> yes, I, and I was kind of in the same ballpark. Full bodies, I would guess, were probably in the 15 to 20 range, and then the rest of those are all cremations. But as far as those spots go, lots of people have their spots purchased already. Okay. It, yes, I mean, we can't, you can't bank on those spots, you know, 40 or 50 spots being purchased. Um, because, I mean, they, you may purchase a full body burial spot, but then decide to put six cremations in there, which is allowed. Um, uh, you know, or, you know, you bury a grandparent in a full body and then put the next six relatives on top in a cremation. So there's no other lot sales for that family or whatever. So we run around out of space next year. Probably a dozen a year, something like that is, is about right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, what I, I'm going to hand this sheet out because as you can see on the screen, it's impossible to read. And on one side, this is salary, employee salaries and wages, and on the back side is benefit options. Mary helped with this. Actually, she did it with, with Thrift Sharon, I think, in all. Curzy. Curzy. Yeah, Sharon retired. Oh, did she? Yeah. She's not going to use the word nose that I'm using my Okay. So I wanted to start the conversation because, again, besides capital projects, salaries and wages are always put in and then multiple meetings so from talking earlier in the year during a study session I believe not this is my perspective so I hear call down over the years the different boards I've worked for I've always had different perspectives and different ways of going about it. Some years a survey with other municipalities, the government compared to government support, others didn't like it. They compete. All employees of the same group. That's hard to do because when the oil and gas is booming, those guys are being paid tons of money. During recession, they're laid off, and you, you, know, and you can 
compared to someone else. So there's no, really no apples to apples. So I use government. That's the only career I have is government. So number two, there's not a town in the upper car front range the same size as the platform, which I can find. They're close. The south's about 2,000. Hawaiians. But there's not another town that has 3,000 people or 2,800 people around here. So what I used to do years ago, I used to do this myself. I'd pick three communities in close proximity just below us, which is typically Kersey, um, either Lock Bowie or Alt, and LaSalle, and then three towns slightly bigger than us, which used to be Milliken and, and uh, Decono, but they don't only want to qualify more half the time because, or at least, I try to stay under 5,000. But those communities have expanded so much, they're way below, above 5,000. So this is 15 communities. I think it was done pretty nice uh, by Mary and the, and the other clerks. They share information. It's supposed to be comparable based upon job, based upon department and job title. Flatville is a third from the right. I'm getting this out for you to, to look at to see just how we stack, I mean, because this is a market that we compete with. It's not going to be around the bush. When we lose employees, and they go government elsewhere, this is where they go for the most part. Um, and then on the back side, you have more about the benefits as far as health care, insurance, dental, uh, retirement plans. What I thought was unique, or not unique, but interesting, is birth that had a longevity program just like ours. But their numbers in the years are a little different than what we have. So there's a lot of information to review and digest if I wanted the process to get started. If you want me to provide you anything else, I'd be happy to. Just uh, let it myself or Mary know. Um, I brought a list of the benefits if you want to see that, the health yeah. costs. Yeah, that's great. So, our officers pay, this is breaking down into hours, it's 1887 to 2245. Mm -hmm. So last time that you approved, this is just a more specific breakdown on uh, what the board approved and what the employee pays out of pocket for employee only on the plan, spouse, children, or family, so that gives you a better concept of how that works. Is that right, Mary? Correct. Okay. Um, the ones that show a negative amount in the past, um, if there were two plans and you chose plan B, and another plan was slightly less expensive. There wasn't an offset of that total value. It just paid the lesser amount. So I showed the what possibly could carry over if you wanted to do that. And also the board years ago said that uh, on the Vision Dental, the town does not pick up all the costs. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a ratio or it's a, it's a cost share. But it's not it's a huge amount, but, but still, it all ends up. So, just provide you some information to review, talk about. Do you make any suggestions with the proposals? Well, my answer to that is I I think we've done a pretty good job overall keeping and retaining the voice. You know, we've had to work hard to do that. The longevity benefits have helped. Uh, it just depends on the employee how that's used. Uh, if you're applying it towards family insurance, it's, not, it's beneficial, but someone who's single can use it for retirement. It just depends on how you look at it. But also, some of these other towns, 
also provide, like Berkeley, <coughs> a better longevity program and along with better wages. My goal is to be competitive so I can retain and, and attract good employees. I've worked for communities that, when I started here, Spencer, the, and I don't want to bring anybody else up, but I remember conversations in the room where the employee don't like it, get rid of them, then quit and just hire someone else. It's just re, a replacement cycle. I don't believe in that. If someone can't do the job, get rid of them. If they're doing a good job, work for retain them because it'll save you money at the end of the day. It really will. Because training and training alone, like the police department's a good example. You don't have a training officer per se dedicated just to go out there and train rookies. That rookie is assigned to a, or an officer already on the beat. So that officer has to double dip. They've got to train and patrol dudes from the phone. Carl used to do that for years. So, same with public works. You know, you don't just come out to the wolves. So, I don't know if that answered. If you're looking for a percentage or dollar amount. Well, what, are, what would you like to do? Would you like to see us increase wages? Would you like to see us talk about helping out with insurance costs? Where would the employees um, be most happy to see an increase for their expenses less than? Yeah. <laughs> the majority of people I've talked to that have talked to me said increase hourly or salary would raise is what they would want the most. Because as a whole, that's the employee base. If you offset insurance, you know, only a few need that. I mean, not that they're less important, but as a whole, the hourly wage, the salary wage, is the, the biggest request. So. I've been uh, trying to come up with some type of uh, more permanent policy, shall I say. Uh, Total employee compensation, whether however it's measured, um, but the total contribution that the town makes to the sum total of the salaries of all our employees. And I can't say that I've come up with the answer, but it would seem, well, in the past, employee compensation packages have. The discussion has come up on an annual basis or semi-annual basis in the board, in my experience. It seems to be an unsatisfactory way to set the policy. So if there was a more permanent written policy that the employees would certainly be aware of ahead of time, as with the board and the budget process. So that, and I don't know exactly how to construct this, so maybe some other people can think about this as well. But if it's tied to some portion of the revenue or the total revenue, or whether it's sales tax or, or across all of the funds, some sort of increase in revenue, right? So yes. what, what we so did it, over the previous so is it a, year. Right, yeah. So that the total revenue that the town takes in from all sources increases just, let's just say 5% is, a, is an example. That some portion, a policy could be reduced to writing that would give a portion of that increase in salaries or total compensation package, whether it's uh, benefits or whether it's wages or, or whether the employees choose how they want to distribute that themselves. Uh, employees aren't a one-size-fits-all situation. Some would rather have it in their retirement. Some would rather have it in cash, even though it's taxed. Some to the dental benefit or, or whatever they choose. It's not for us to say how they should spend their money, but it, it would do two things. Well, at least two things. First of all, it leaves these annual discussions about salaries off the board's agenda. If there's a policy in place that addresses that 
as policy, as board policy. I know in previous years it's been kind of hit and miss. I'm not here to criticize previous boards or their actions, but having a written policy in place allows the employees to see what they're looking at in the future mm -hmm. and better plan their budget or what have you. And, and, and it takes all of that off of the, the board's agenda on an annual basis. Except to, I mean, it's not to say the policy can't be adjusted, changed, or what have you, but if it were started off some baseline policy, it says if revenues go up 5%, then a certain percentage of that increase is earmarked solely for employee compensation package. Okay. And part of that as merit-based, and part of it as, you know, just a general increase, annual increase. I mean, yeah, it can be. I did survey a few other town panels, town managers, to see what they do. Uh, no one said they actually had a policy because a lot of the governing bodies were hesitant to put it in writing, so they've had practices, budgetary practices. I don't know what that means exactly, but uh, a couple years ago, uh, the assistant manager in uh, Brighton, for example, back in Paris, it was, it was interesting because they they did a two percent cost of living across the board, and then based upon budgetary revenues and expenditures, if there's a threshold that was met. They give up an extra three to five percent on top of that two percent, so it's a mixture. So in a bad year, quote unquote, you know, because milk and it, gas always goes up, you know, it's not gas all the time, but there's always inflation of some form. Yeah. There's always that minimum one two percent building, and then on the on the good years, like like Larry said, the revenues, and like two three years ago, the revenues far outseed expenditures. That's where we put a lot of money in the bank. That was a year where additional money, but yet, even with that, my only thing is on the fluctuation of, of revenues and economies. If you give employees, I'm not trying to be double happy with you, but you have to maintain the budget during down years as well as good years. Absolutely. Right. I think that's why Larry was saying that the threshold has to be met that the revenues exceeded the previous years. You know, we saw an increase in funds, so we're going to distribute that to a portion of that to the employees. You don't see another policy that says if there's not an increase in revenue, then there won't be no. We don't have to give no right, raise exactly. for that fiscal year. And it's yeah. not because we don't want to, it's just we don't have it. Right. right. I do see it as a way to avoid a contentious conversation every year. Yep. And I think, I think the discussion always needs to be these base pays, you know, starting officers, starting, you know, so on and so forth. Those need to be adjusted every couple of years because other towns, you know, you can't just keep a base pay of $22,000 for, you know, umpteen years. Those base pays need to be adjusted as well. I will say just for historical value that in 2005, <coughs> the first year I was here, the board with Nick Meyer, the town manager, they decided to do a, a survey because they wanted to do those adjustments. They paid a firm five thousand dollars to do a statewide survey of communities similar to the size of Platteville. And when you're comparing Platteville to the Western Slope or Northern Slope, they called out of the drive. It has to be the front range. But I remember from that time, that was probably the biggest pay increase. I remember in 2006, my officers at the time probably got between 10 and 13 percent increase because they had to get back to adjusting, like Adrian said, every three to five years. You have to reevaluate your policy to see are, am I staying competitive? And you have to do that big jump on occasion. Does Just, that happen? When's the last time we used to we, uh, we did it about four years ago. Four years ago is like a dollar straight across the board. Okay, okay so, then three years ago. Three years it ago. was one of my first two budgets yeah. and it was brutal. Yeah. It was brutal. Yeah. Well, it, it's not just, I mean, you're, you're committing it when you say do a 2% cost to live it. You, you're committing that money into in the future budgets that you really have no idea what the revenues are going to look like. Right. But on the other hand, there's there's a compensation that you receive when you don't have to go and hire replacement people and train them. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it costs money to hire, train, 
in the case of the police department, I'm sure there's overtime involved. The uh, cost of training. The, the cost, cost of training, the whatever uniforms or so on. I mean, there's there's costs in there that you don't incur if you can retain the help. Mm -hmm. One of the ways, of course, you retain the help is to make a competitive wage. So, I mean, some would argue you pay one <laughs> way to pay the other. I'd much rather raise the pay <coughs> and not have vacancies because somebody's going 20 miles up the road for another 6,000 bucks a year. So what's wrong with the increase in revenue basing a percent of the total increase revenue? So say from 2018 to 2019, we're projecting a increased revenue of $60,000. Just saying. Well, I think we should crunch the numbers. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, it's sort, of, sort of the board has hard numbers to look at. What's it, what is the total cost? To the town in this increased salaries. Um, of course, there's on top of that, there's employer share, Social Security, Medicare, so on and so forth. I mean, so, so that all has to be factored in in order to realize what is the actual cost. You know, so, but I guess my basic premise is to. <coughs> Think about some kind of formula that can be applied that is going to be able to fit in the budget, and but still be some type of. I don't know if there's other options other than a written policy, uh, a sense of the board resolution, if you will, that this is what we intend to do, this is what we'd like to do, we'll do this if it's possible, uh, or something connected to the to the revenues. Mm -hmm. so those thresholds don't have to be attached to each other, right? So let's say we see a 5% increase in, from 2018 to 2019, right? Just turning out the general numbers mm -hmm. and revenues. Then that would trigger us to allow a 2% cost of living raise for the employees or something like that. Now, those two numbers don't have to be tied together. Like if we get this much, we have to give that much. We just have to say, my idea is that we see this much, we, the revenues went up this much, so I guess now we'll be able to give that cost of living. It would enable a minimum. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And cost of living should be tied to these minimum that he pays, but merit pay should not. Because we have somebody here who's worked here for umpteen years and they get paid a whole lot more money because they have longevity and everything else, then you know, they retire. One option. We're not just gonna bring in a new man and pay them the same amount of money. That's super important. What do you think about that idea for? I see both ways. I mean some organizations like LaSalle and the public collectors that They'll pay an entry level officer the same as tenure officers because that's just how they compete. I don't believe in that. I believe you got to work your way up. I mean, not just law enforcement, but public work, even in the front office. But um, I personally think, looking at these numbers, that uh, I think we're close to a point, if not this year, next year, then just competitive adjustments should be considered and then implement a policy as far as that percentage, but that's just my, my verbiage, you know, I'm just answering your question. Um, it would be pushing it to try and get this policy written and enacted during budget season, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so we'd have to come up with what we want and then push it to the next budget or before next budget, spring. Yeah, it wouldn't necessarily have to be go into effect <coughs> With this budget, I could. Uh, we can go. We can have it go into effect whenever we want it to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could. It could go in. When? When is? When do we have the actual numbers of property tax estimated receipts at the end of the year? September. Oh, they come in September. No, we get the the last usually the last week of August. I get the <coughs> tax adjustments. Tax adjustments. Tax adjustments. So to tighten up beginning of the policy 
to when you know <coughs> the property tax receipts are going to be, for instance. Is it total revenue or just public tax? Well, I, I envision total revenue, yeah. but, but I mean, I'm, I'm just tossing it out. I mean, you could tie it to property tax if you wanted to. Uh, I'm just, I'd be scared on that one. <laughs> well, <laughs> like, we go ahead a recession, my house is twelve five hundred thousand dollars valuation. Right. Well, I, I'm just tossing out the idea of having some policy established. I agree. And then trying to figure out how to make the formula or what to have the formula tied to. That's more a group decision. I'm, I'm not willing to yeah. to. Uh, Make a concrete suggestion as to what it should be tied to. I think a lot. Adrian and I talked last week. You mentioned the board about some towns try to do a a percentage of total operations. Mm -hmm. And how you put that so, together? So, so service-based industry, fifty-five to sixty percent of their budget goes to employees because if it's not for the employees, service doesn't happen. And our budget sitting at between 49 and 51, I think, is what David and I came up with last, last year. year. Mm -hmm. It's pretty low. So, so there's that too. Yeah, there's any number of, mm -hmm. of input numbers you could tie it to. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm not suggesting that this discussion should be over tonight. I mean, it's for no, I, some homework for everybody to go home and think about. I think it's a great idea because it just getting rid of the argument. It takes a lot of pressure out of the Well, exactly. But, you know, that would be huge for me. I love that. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, our time can be better spent arguing about salaries if there was some policy in place that, again, the policy could change. I and mean, anything that could be decided on the board could be undecided sure, as well. Sure. Um, but, uh, just to uh, yeah, it would make our time a lot more productive, perhaps later on yeah. down the road. Absolutely. Uh, so what, what's the next I've been thinking about? Let's just uh, toss that out. I've been thinking about that for three years. So I know three board members aren't here. Do you want to, Mayor? Do you want to discuss or something? Want to discuss this with them, and then for me again, say we're on the same page. Absolutely. And then let me know what next steps you want me to take or what you want to do. I have talked to Troy Bloom about this already, and he's all on board, 100%. Okay. Do you think well. about it as well, Troy, what factors sure. it would be um, you know, triggered on and what that would look like? And you become my, aware. my biggest thing is consistency, what the policy is. I mean, booms and recessions. <coughs> I get that. I mean, there's plenty of times. Like me, myself, there's been more years than not that I got zero. Well, I get it. It's easier for employees to swallow no rates when they know there's no extra money coming in. Well, that's just it. As long as the employees can see, quote unquote, a black and white, it's like, I'm not getting a raise because this town, we're going through a recession. Nobody's getting it. Exactly. They can buy off on that better than, mm -hmm. you know what, Milligan just got two or an hour increase, I got 20 cents. Yeah. No, that doesn't, doesn't put that in black and white for them. Yeah, that doesn't work. So, well, I think we squeezed out about what was it, twenty some odd thousand dollars last year? 20. No, the beginning of this year. Well, beginning of this yes. year. Yes. For yes. Him yes. That went through employee <laughs> raise now. It, it it wasn't a king's ransom by any means, but I, from what I get feedback, it was, it was noticed, appreciated. And the, the, uh, the employees, I think, got the sense that the, uh, the board is committed to doing what it can to improve their lot as within the constraints of the budget. Um, it makes a big difference when the employees for the board supports you. Okay. Or you can't take board support to the King Supers and get a bag of groceries. No. I can take you shopping with me, though. <laughs> okay. Oh, boy. <laughs> I dare you. <laughs> <laughs> Just sit in the car, you get a Not a problem. <laughs> I'm sure you don't want this cash. 
So yeah, ultimately, yeah. nothing's going to happen in this town without the employees. Nothing. So well, that's yeah. okay. I, right. I mean, you know, I, and this board should be at least make it clear to the employees that they're appreciated. Yeah. I, I, we're fortunate enough, fortunate to have very dedicated professional staff from top to bottom. Yes. And, um, and they should know that. And I know when I was working, the only reason I went in was because of the check they gave me on Friday. I wasn't there for the respect or the appreciation or the pat on the back or any of the rest of that stuff. I was there for the money. Not the life. I had bills to pay. And, you know, the employees here are no different. I know Dave doesn't need to work, but that's. You no, know, he just comes in because he likes it here. <laughs> I don't want to stress too far now. Or <laughs> well, maybe I exaggerated a little bit. Okay, so moving on, if I may, next Tuesday, the, the draft budget in totality will be given to the board. I'll use tonight's conversation to plug in some capital project numbers, but others I can't. I have to finish the bank in your worksheets today. So actually the next two days. I was not thinking Friday off to let us be cold, so I'll probably work out today, Mary, because I can't really paint when it's 40 degrees in the morning. Oh, come on. I know. It'll be fun. And I want to make sure the packet will go out on Friday, just so you know, not Thursday, because I need the time. So I've got some other meetings to attend to. Um, and then on the 9th, we'll start digging into um, the general fund. At that time, this can be rediscussed again or at one of the other meetings, but the ninth is the general fund from beginning to end, starting with legislative, executive, judicial, all the way to the very end. So it's going to be a sequential order as the budget is established. I used to bounce around, I'm not doing that. So we're just going to scroll right through the budget as presented in the financials. Uh, other than the special revenue funds that will be focused on majority of on the 10th, which is the Tuesday, Wednesday, back to back in two weeks. Is that on the paper you're sending us? Yep. Awesome. And then the uh, following week is the you know the enterprise the enterprise funds will be big conversation. That's water tour. And then the impact of capital from the fund will, will be there. The 23rd, the last Tuesday of the month, really is, is just reserved as needed. To revisit anything, I always have one night reserved in case there's something pending. We and should just have a party. Right. Have a party at Larry's, okay. <laughs> what you have it? What are the big, top, big discussions for the enterprise? Well, why are the sewer? Well, we, we, we hit on it tonight. Yeah, but we just we did, but you're actually seeing the budgetary numbers with operations because we tried to maintain the best operation for both water and sewer, but we need to build cash reserves in both. So we really need to look at those numbers. Like, you know, David has capital outlay items. You know, one thing I didn't bring up tonight is annual slip climbing, jet, jetting. So uh, with the water, they're always buying meters, you know, stuff like that. So you're proposing a rate increase to make the fund more solvent or the water fund the sewer fund the last couple of years we've been a one percent increase i have not proposed that yet no sewer's going to go up because sewer i'm waiting on that study so i don't want to do either one of those until that study it won't affect water but it's all one utility bill yeah. it doesn't so it's going to come in probably december january when that conversation happens personally i would think we would try to not raise if we can but that's gonna get raised which is part of why we're the PR that Troy mentioned earlier. Information on support. We can't make them read it, but if we put it in front of their face with the hopes that they do, there will be so many angry people here yelling at the girls in public works. Well, part of it is even though we don't have to pay for this for three, four years, we have to increase rates now as soon as the state's done yeah. to, to start building those funds, not just not necessarily to pay for it, but to maintain it once it's built. So we're not going to raise sewer rates in four years. They're going to have to be done in 2019. Is that study going to include what maintenance is going to be? I don't know, David. Is that part of it? Yeah. 
Fantastic. They, they, the, the, the rate portion of that study is going to, well, when they design it, they, they put a engineer's best estimate as to the capital cost for the construction, and then they also put an engineer's best estimate to the 20 years operations and maintenance of that. And those two numbers, then Ralph Tullis is going to take those numbers and say, okay, if the, you know, we, to pay off this debt service and to continue to operate, because this plant is going to cost us at least twice, if not more than that, in operational costs, just <coughs> because it's mechanical. It's going to be much more electrical, much more. You know, and that's where the conversation of do we use part of the grounds eventually to put a solar farm or something like that that could potentially help offset some of those costs and some of that. I mean, and that's all future discussions. But yes, to answer the question, they will come up with a 20 year OM as well as the capital costs. Um, and those numbers, I suspect, if they're anything like our 2011 plan, are going to be very similar because the the, the 2011 plan had us around five to seven million dollars in construction costs, and we were right around the five to seven, eight million dollars, depending on which process, in O and M costs. And, and there's just more detail that has to be discussed over the next few months, really, over that waste like plan because uh, a gentleman named Nick Cresta owns about 10 acres adjacent kind of southeast of the sewer again, but it kind of touches on the corner. And that's in between the community complex and mm -hmm. the Yep. Yeah. Mike Hill sold the 10 acres, and the right next to it was over 18 and a half, so it's sort of maybe south. Then I've been talking to a gentleman who's looking at buying that and putting on a small solar array, and he wants the town to be his client, the sewer I've already given him our meter usage. He hmm. thinks we could cut our cost by 40%. Okay. Yeah. And going mechanized? That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. And he said, I can build it to where it can be expandable. But next month, is every quarter, Excel comes out with these programs where they have to bid to get these solar packages. And, and he's hoping to bid and, and talk to me. And then we're going to have a contract with the board once that time comes, if it all works out. But that can save a huge ton on the mechanized plant is going to some solar, reduce it. The operational costs of the mechanized plant would be about twice as much as what we currently got. If we want to. Is that for utilities, man, mostly? Well, you're going to have to have you're going to have to have a licensed operator beyond what I'm licensed at right now. So we're either going to have to contract for that, or we're going to have to hire that. So that's probably going to be as similar to what my salary is right now. If we decide to hire it, if we contract it out. I mean, I think Mead is paying somewhere between eighty and a hundred thousand dollars a year in contract costs, and that doesn't include their uh, utility bill, and that doesn't include any miscellaneous pieces parts that that contractor has to buy. When the contractor uses a test tube to run us to grab a sample or something like that, they scan it, and the city of Mead gets a bill for it. So. You're going to have the oper the operational costs are going to go up just because of needing the operator <coughs> or a contract operations company to run that for us. Can you just go to class for that? I can. Yeah, you can but then I won't have time to do anything, anything else. <laughs> so, and uh, is it fair to say then that if operational costs are going to double, then the sewer base rate is going to double as well? It would not shock me. I can see going from 25 to 50 very easily. Right now it's about 25 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. And I can honestly go on to 50. And I hate to say it, that's why I need to put this information out to the mayor and the community because I've talked to some other communities and our base rates are really low. Mm -hmm. I mean, our, our utility bill is high, people will say, but our base rate for water sewer is not. Yeah. So you're adding another close to 40 bucks a month. Or thirty bucks a month just for water, water uh, sidewalks, and street lights, plus the trash collection is in there, mm -hmm. yeah. and actual sidewalk payments. And, and some people tend to see it as their water bill, but in fact, 
there's quite a bit more to it than that. Um, just for water sewer data, I talked just offline, and, and you know, he told me what his water sewer bill, just water sewer alone is compared to mine, and his is always higher than mine. I pay $115 a month on my own budget billing with the city of Lumber, and that's water and sewer only. It includes a $2.50 hydrant fee. Mm -hmm. And I pay about 70 bucks on average just for water and sewer. I was talking to someone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't need <laughs> discounts either. <laughs> <laughs> for water. <laughs> I was talking to someone who gave me those trash collection. They're paid forty five dollars a month, and they get oh, picked yeah. up twice a month. That's Not every week. Who does that? In the corner. So anyways, um. So let me know when the you know let's just get to next Tuesday. And during the staff report, if you want to mention when you, what night the board wants to, because I don't have this scheduled again, so it's up to you, let me know. But I'll send you out the, this agenda. Mm -hmm. So look at the upcoming meeting agenda, and then you guys can talk, and then let me know what night you want to plug this in uh, for the employee bit, uh, okay. salaries and, and wages. Okay. So I'll leave it to you. But that way, uh, at least next week, you'll, you'll see the draft budget where the numbers kind of lie. That way, whatever policy you want to look at, or any kind of pay adjustments. Do we need to send out an Everbridge for these study sessions? I forgot last week. That's the only reason why. I usually send one out for every meeting we have, and I just space it out. My apologies. I realized that today when I heard Harold come in, it's like, I didn't get my message about my meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I told Mary's like, crap. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I will get messages out, so I don't think. I really like the way that you put this together, Troy. Thank you. Sure. I try to do it. I mean, don't take offense, but it shouldn't be complicated. Right. I mean, the budget can be, but just look at it black and white and straightforward. This, this is, is a summary of everything. Years. Years. Big over the previous years. Big improvement over previous years. You really need to know where the dollars are, sure. where they come from, and where they're going to go. Yep. I, mean, I hate to make it that simple, but that's my mentality. Uh, so. All right, anything else for tonight? Thank you. We're done. Oh, it's the state session. Right. You don't have to go to Yale. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, there you go. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Carl.